let's get sweaty. Hello and welcome to the Shemu Dojo Show, Season 4, Episode 4. We've decided to make this a full show main episode. Originally, we were just going to talk about this brand new interview that she's speaking to that's just been released um, by the Shemu Dojo for about half an hour. But actually, we, um, in true Shemu Dojo fashion, we talked for over two and a half hours. So yeah, we're going to make this a, a mainline show. We're going to switch into the previous video talk that we uh, actually recorded when we were doing this interview in a moment but just before we get to that guys we have a giveaway as part of this episode a special giveaway unfortunately not signed but this is from Yu Suzuki's own personal collection it's a Shimu 3 band-aid promotional band-aid he actually gave one of these to both myself and Switch as a bit of a, a gift uh, I wish I'd had the hindsight actually to think of asking him, could you sign this? And we'll use this as a giveaway because I already have this, so I don't need a, a second one. But if you do want to win a Shemu 3 Band-Aid, just leave a comment in the video description below. Or if you listen to this on the podcast version, Radio Sega or something, be quick, drop a comment on the YouTube variant of the show. You can find on our YouTube channel at Shemu Dojo VOD. And probably expire this giveaway at the end of june maybe yeah what do you think matt end okay. of june end of june uh, if we remember we should remember give us a poke if we don't remember uh we'll give that away and we'll tell uh the the, the prize winner on a, a future episode of the shimu dojo show but before we drop into the main interview with yu suzuki himself we have a very short news section for you detailing a very very new piece or pieces of Shenmue merchandise. Hey guys, welcome to a quick news update. Uh, today I'm quite excited to show off uh, for the very first time that Insert Coin have released a small but awesome looking range of uh, Shenmue merchandise and I'm going to show these off for you right now. Uh, there is a new jacket which is priced at $84.99 which is like a bomber jacket type thing and there is interestingly a Shenmue pin based on the tag off the back of Rio's jacket which looks really really cool as well uh, I think that's around six pound if my memory serves me correctly but the purchase links will be in the YouTube description for everybody to see and grab these items for themselves uh, I imagine they're going to sell out pretty damn quickly let's have a look at the images here for everybody so bring it up first you can see the back of the jacket there I'm going to zoom in so everybody can see that the detailing on the tiger looks particularly good I am told it is hand stitched for, um for the jacket and all the patches are as well uh just moving in you can see the front of the jacket here like i said it's very much a bomber jacket type style item um it does look really really good it's very similar to one they did a few years ago i think 2016 2017 potentially uh you can see the uh women's fitted jacket there as well very similar look but look, again looks really really good the, there's a full front um image there of the jacket as well uh there's the back again and then you can see them sort of in a studio environment as well. That tiger looks really, really good. It's very big, actually. It's bigger than I probably anticipated, but again, looks really, really cool. There's the front of it. It's got black lining in it, which I think is probably quite a nice look. It means it differentiates off a little bit from the brown of the jacket itself. Uh, it looks like quite a nice sort of thin type jacket, so it's not like a winter jacket, but it does look really cool all the same. It's like the sort of jacket you might wear on a... On a late summer's evening, if I was if I was to put my money on it there. Uh, there's the back of it again in the studio. There's the front of it uh, opened up with the white t-shirt. And there's another front image there as well. Moving on, then you have the Shenmue Tiger pin. Now, people may remember from the anime they did a Tiger pin, which I'll show in a minute for everybody. But this is an enamel pin. The one from the anime was more of a, I think it was almost printed on if my memory serves me correctly. So that's like a, a quick look at the pin. There's another angle of it for you to have a look at. 
Uh, and then you can see it on the back of some jeans there as well. So to show off the difference, I guess, I haven't got the, the insert coin pin here yet. Uh, when it does come, I will do an unboxing video so you can see it. But if you look here, um, hopefully this comes up for everybody to see. It doesn't... Yeah, we go. You can see it's more of a printed design. It's quite thin, the anime one there. Hopefully, you can, that's better. You can just see that there. If you look at the back of it, um, again, it's fine, but it doesn't strike me. It's not quite an enamel pin. The, the stuff on the front is printed, um, and it's quite a thin pin. I like the design of it, don't get me wrong, but the design of the insert coin one looks much, much better for me in terms of the looks of the quality. Obviously, I haven't had it in my hand yet. I'll be very interested to get it in my hand, and I will show it off. But on the face of it, it looks really, really cool. Great to see some new Shenmue merch. It's been a, quite a while since we've had some. Um, bit left field, Insert Coin are doing it, but I am not going to complain in any way, shape or form. But what I am going to do is go and buy myself some Shenmue merch and you should do the same. There you have it, guys. That's the new section. Make sure you check out the jacket and the pin over on insertcoin.com. Uh, they are available right now for everybody to pick up and buy. But thank you guys for dropping in. Now is the main event, the thing you've been waiting for. Here it is, the interview with Yu Suzuki. Hey guys, welcome to this extra special um, episode of the Shenmue Dojo show. Uh, you've probably seen by now that we have had an exclusive on the ground face to face interview at WiseNet. Uh, James conducted that um, in April when he was over in Japan. We're going to go through the interview, through the questions, look at the answers and have some discussion around what Yu Suzuki actually told us. It's a massively, massively in-depth interview. Um, credit to James and Switch who have worked on this or behind the scenes over the last few weeks but James first how are you doing and number two what was it like to be face to face with the man himself conducting that interview <laughs> hi guys how's everyone doing uh, I'm doing okay thank you very much Matt um back in sunny England right now uh, yeah I just got back from Japan I had an absolutely incredible time three weeks first week Kyoto second week Tokyo third week Okinawa so been a bit all over the country really but nothing beats that day meeting Yu Suzuki in per person for this this face-to-face -face interview um very very privileged to have been invited to go to, to WiseNet offices there and sit down and it's just an incredible experience and to be able to to actually have this interview that was like I mean, this is some uh, switches I like, built this interview. So we kind of came up with questions together, and then he's gone off and printed them so that we had them ready for the day. And like, it was supposed to be an hour interview, and Yusuke actually gave us an extra additional time just to get through all the questions because we had so many. Um, <laughs> these have been building up over the years, right, Matt? So yeah, definitely. It was amazing, amazing to be able to get all these off. So a little bit of context to how this sort of originated. So, uh, like I said, we were invited to WiseNet. Um, I met up with Switch a couple of times whilst in Japan. So after getting sort of the news that you know this interview's on with a date set for the tenth of April, I met up with Switch. We went down to Zushi, which is sort of like the seaside sort of area of Japan, uh, a little bit outside of Tokyo. Um, and we actually went for a hike just to sort of I fancied a hike and discuss <laughs> some of the questions that we we're going to be asking. Um, and interestingly, Zushi. Uh, Switch was telling me this. Apparently, that's where AM2 actually went as sort of a retreat away from the the Sega offices back in Tokyo or wherever the, the Sega offices okay, were. Okay, yeah. A little bit because obviously it's a seaside area. These like nice views of the the beach and stuff. But apparently, <laughs> they didn't sleep for like forty eight hours because they were preparing material on the way to Zushi, like twenty four hours spent on the material, and then when they got there. You were in 24-hour uh, meetings all day, so it wasn't very like relaxing <laughs> of a place. But uh, yeah, Zushi was amazing. Uh, had a nice hike there, and so we sort of built these questions up. And then when the big day came, early in the morning, met up with, with Switch again from PhantomRiverstone.com, of course. Had a coffee, some last little strats before we actually rolled up to the, the WiseNet's offices, and Joel greeted us at the door. Uh, walked inside a few steps and Yu Suzuki started coming over and it was just it's incredible I mean we did it that day in Monaco right Matt where yeah. you're seeing him for the first time and you sort of your, your heart skips a bit it's it's 
it sounds a bit strange because it's like you know that's normally like with a love interest but like <laughs> the the admiration you have for like you suzuki it's it is meeting one of your heroes isn't it so seeing him just stood there in front of you you know it's it, it's it's crazy it's a crazy experience and obviously i was nervous I've been nervous for the weeks prior to this since finding out that this was a, a thing that was was going to happen. And then as soon as we were in the room and he, they just made us feel so comfortable, so welcoming, they walked us into the the, 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 the large meeting room at the back of the, the offices there, um, sat us down on you know some really comfy seats, uh, really nice. He uh, sat opposite us, so, so it was me here, and then directly opposite, like I'm looking at you, Matt, was Yu Suzuki and then Joel was to the right and then um, I got switched next to me here and Yu Suzuki brought in some waters, bottles of waters for everyone and just a really nice as, as soon as I sat down I felt confident confident about it because this don't forget this is like the very first interview that I've ever ever done so for it to be with like Yu Suzuki as well is just just insane so uh, yeah that pretty much sets up where we're at then Matt with the you know the initials yeah, and it, as, as you say, James, it's an absolute privilege that the dojo has been invited in to WiseNet, you know, and it's an absolute honour. And I must, my thanks goes out to Yuzuzuki Joel, obviously, for helping get this thing off mm -hmm. the ground and being so accommodating a, around not just this interview, actually, but I think the, the, the stuff that Dojo puts out in general, it's, yeah. it's always been a pleasure and they've been nothing but accommodating with us so again this just ex extends that for me much much further so in addition as well joel tess has kindly provided a japanese translation for the website as well so for those japanese fans out there you are completely catered for as well and thank you to sun who's designed the very fancy looking banners um, at the top of each section for us to separate the interview out mm -hmm. so that's the, the sort of all the thank you for that but the way we're going to structure this episode is we're going to go through the questions they're all sectioned off into various different bits so we're going to go through those in, in in order that they're presented um, i will show clips of the questions from the website so everybody can see it um, and also there will be some bits and pieces photos and things within the article that we've got as well um, we'll read the questions out we'll answer them so i'll read them out james will answer them and then we'll dive into some individual discussion around those questions some will obviously have more than others depending on the nature of the answer at the time and then hopefully by the end of it we will reveal shenmue 4's release date shenmue 5's release date and we'll all be very happy <laughs> yeah temper your expectations there matt <laughs> <laughs> yeah of course so let's let's dive straight in then. So this was conducted in April, um, and I will say, James, in, in sort of going forward, the, the way you structured this page is brilliant. I think it looks really, really professional. In the way Thanks, man. Together. So yeah. going through a little bit here, and sorry, you'll see me skipping between screens if I'm looking at the camera. Um, James has put together a nice little blurb here about how this all came together. They spend an hour and twenty minutes there. And there's a picture of Yu Suzuki himself there, sat looking quite happy and cheerful, I must say, in that photo. Yeah, well, the photographing stuff was really difficult because you feel rude to just get a camera out and start snapping photos because you don't know how much of this is personal, private, mm. or, you know, you don't want to really... It's difficult anyway because you're not really meant to take photographs in Japan as such, like, because people don't really like that. It's not something that is you know you just pop a camera out and take something from someone's face it's a yeah. bit awkward feeling so I kind of had to ask is it okay if i take a photo now and um switch was also taking some like the odd photo with his phone but we were kind of focused so much on the interview that i kind of wish we'd have got more photographs if that makes sense but the ones that we got actually came out really well so i'm really, really quite, quite pleased in general like not really got too many regrets from this interview i think like like you say it's it was structured well, and there's so much to get through as well. I, I, I'm again, like you say, that expressing a thanks for like just being able to ask this many questions because it's got to be one of the chunkiest interviews, I think, um, especially regarding Shemu at least. Yeah, for a, for a long, long time actually as well. I'm yeah. thinking back to sort of Gamescom 2019. Obviously, we had the privilege of a written interview last mm. year, but that was more mm -hmm. focused in on, on Air Twister and the release around that, and I completely understand that. And we did throw in a Shenmue question, you can't not, but oh, course, this is yeah. the, like, the most in-depth, in my opinion, Shenmue interview for a few years, and I think there's some really good nuggets in this. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that because 
thinking back to Air Twister, they kind of didn't want us to ask any Shenmue questions, if you remember. No. Because obviously, they were kind of focused on Air Twister, so it's like, don't take away from this. But then to be so for, 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 forthright, or whatever the word is, um, in, in this interview, with like every question can be Shenmue related, which is you know something that we haven't had the, like you say, the privilege of for quite a few years now. No, and it, and we definitely took advantage of it. So let's let's go straight in. Yep. So going down the page of the website here, you can see the interview date, who it's conducted by, um, Phantom Riverstone, and of course James from Shenmue Dojo. Uh, the first section is Virtua Fighter RPG. So we're starting right at the beginning of everything here, and I actually think that's, that makes a lot of sense here. So the first question um, is around Virtua Fighter RPG. So here we go. So as Shenmue fans, we were very interested in the early form of Shenmue which was going to be called a project called Virtual Fighter RPG. Do you still possess the original design documents and other materials that you created for Virtual Fighter RPG? Yeah, so the, the thinking behind this question was just to sort of understand what material they actually have from back in those days that are going to help them to structure a, a storyline in Shenmue 3 and 4. Um, we're hoping to sort of get that sort of nugget of information that sort of says that oh, they've still got all this old material. It's not stuck in a vault somewhere in Sega's offices. So, you know, Shenmue, the future of Shenmue is in good hands in that sense because it's it's based on this old material from back in the day. Yeah. So Yu Suzuki's answer actually is, Virtua Fighter RPG was my first RPG title and it was creating something that was entirely new, which carried a risk. So I thought that creating an RPG using the Virtua Fighter IP might be safer, which led to the project. However, not a lot of material remains now. So yeah, like I was saying, where's that material now? It's it must be in a Sega vault somewhere. Which uh, <laughs> I don't know. You'd think they they would all have copies of these things, but obviously not. And it's very interesting that uh, isn't it that mm. that they don't have a lot of that material. Obviously, coming down the page a little bit here, um, you can see the photo of, of the scripts. This is from a Game Informer interview from yeah. two thousand and nineteen. Uh, and Switch, I believe, translated that white page on the right-hand side, didn't it? It's on its website. Yeah. Um, so, sort of follow-up to that, you are, there's it's, it's a question, you, you make reference to the Game Informer 2019 interview, there's photos showing the scripts. Yeah, and it sort of com comes back in before we finish the question, it's like, these these ones are almost Shemu. They're not yeah. quite, you know, they're not Virtua Fighter RPG. These, these. So they must have quite a few different stages of design documents so virtual fighter rpg and then the progress and he says these are almost shamu that he's uh, he's showing in that image which is interesting to sort of think about the progression of this thing when mm. you think it obviously started developing on the saturn there'd have been a draft there um yeah. it's then potentially been restarted on the saturn accelerated hardware which we know existed um and that's talked about um, in another interview that we we've done fairly recently Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, then restarted again for a third yeah. time on the Dreamcast. Which, so the amount of design documents they must have gone through to get to the point of Shenmue, you know, it's staggering. Really, it's absolutely it's insane. We can sort of yeah. sort of see where the money went, I guess, a little bit. True. Yeah. So many rewrites and whatnot. Yeah. So then, the next question is, um, what is the difference between the blue books and the white pages? Yeah, so this was an interesting one. We kind of, obviously, we got that game informer photograph there. We just kind of wanted to know what the difference was between the blue books and the white pages. And Yu Suzuki says that the white pages are the novelized version, and the blue books contain the scripts. So very interesting. So he actually left the room at this point because obviously he, he he wanted to show us these these blue books, and you know, amazingly, that that is something that we. We were hoping would happen if you know what i mean as well because seeing these historic pieces of shemu history is is like is, is is crazy for a big fan so he actually left the room and returned with the, the five legend of akira blue books and he said that these are the scripts with the dialogue so there for the cast they were given to each of the voice actors the pages have a space at the top for the actors to write notes so that was interesting that was something i didn't actually realize um so those blue original um, Legend of, of Akira books are actually the ones that were handed out to cast members for, for voice lines. Um, and then the, the, the white paper in that image is actually the novelized version. 
So they kind of have like a book written, in a sense, of the outline of Shenmue, um, which is very interesting. That is interesting. It does beg the question, I guess, that if worse came to worse, they would be in a position that they could release a novel fairly swiftly by the sounds of it if they wanted to obviously that's the last resort we know that all the time that there's a chance etc etc he wants to make Shenmue in game form but it's interesting it's already been novelized and then they've expa- I guess expanded that into the script that yeah, makes sense that makes sense yeah so I've, yeah I'd be very interested to see what's in that um, one of those scripts which we'll come on to in one of the next questions but mm-hmm. You then asked the question, were they the scripts used for the actual Shenmue? Yeah, and then he turned around and said, yes, the the name was later changed to Shenmue. Uh, and then the, the books that he, he was showing us, we, we made the point that they were kind of like a, a B5 size because they always felt or looked like they were bigger than mm. they actually were. So when you're actually holding them, they're more like a B5 size and um, the paper inside's like a slightly yellowed colored. Uh, but he said that that was because they're printed on a specific type of paper. A really nice paper, actually, like almost like that sort of aged look to them, even though they are an old <laughs> an old book as such because they are like 25 plus years now. But that was the, the actual design of them as, as well when they were made, like the sort of yellow coloured paper. And then there's a serial number on the back of each of them to, to sort of keep track of them all. So if they ever, you know got in the, the hands of the wrong person or something they could maybe potentially track that back to where it would have come from i guess so they're gonna hunt you down if you steal yeah, them basically exactly <laughs> um and then you go on to ask were they the ones used in the kickstarter award or very similar to that yeah well yusuke says that's right so they were they were the the same ones from the kickstarter uh they go up to chapter five which was interesting so they, there isn't actually any any chapters after that that have been written uh, he says, this one is Yokosuka, chapter one, he was showing us the first one, and then chapter two, Hong Kong, where Ren shows up. Then the pro- progression of the game differs from the way that he had first planned them. So this one contains the script for Shuzo. So that was chapter three. But in the game, Guilin is shown first, so the order is reversed compared to the original order. And he says, Shuzo will be in Shemu 4 instead. So if you think, obviously, after Hong Kong, we Obviously, we went to Kowloon, but that's kind of that same chapter, chapter two. And then the next chapter was Guilin, which is chapter five. So they sort of skipped the three and four, which is what he means there. That's the structure of yeah. the game has changed from these original designs. And then he's he's now saying, which is, I think it's the first time he's actually publicly said this, but Shuzo, which is chapter three, will be in Shemu 4 instead. So um, if you think back to the, the chapter tiles map, and it, it kind of feels like the chapter tiles are based on these books. I'm, I mean, I'm not too sure about the Baisha book, which was the fifth book. Yeah. Um, but the third chapter tile is the train journey to Shuzo. And then I think chapter four chapter tile is Shanghai on that chapter tile outline. So, yeah, uh, make of that as you will. If, you know, we're going to Shuzo, does that mean the train's going to be there now? Has he kind of confirmed that or not? I don't know. That's interesting, and also when you look at the chapter cards as well, obviously you've got one and two, which are very, we're very, very familiar with what those are. Yeah. Then you've got the train, which we, we've we've talked about in the podcast we did fairly, well, I say fairly recently, depends when we air this, but true. Um, and then after that, you've then got what looks like a fighting arena. Is it Shanghai? Could it be Shuzu? There's there's a lot there that could I said could be merged together perhaps mm. and it does fit in with what he said in the Shenmue Master interviews that we've been through that things are interchangeable so just because that something hasn't appeared that's been essentially I say left behind for want of a better expression that hasn't been used yet doesn't mean it can't reappear down the line in a, in a new structure going forward for the story and that's quite exciting actually that we yeah. may still get something close to the content they had originally planned albeit in a different order mm-hmm. which i'm i'm per- per- perfectly happy with you know if, if he thinks that the story is suited this way um compared to like those original old things and you know he's tailoring the story down the, these paths and stuff like that that sort of make more sense i guess i don't know 
but it, it's nice to at least be confirmed that Shuzo will be in Shenmue 4 instead. He's literally just a statement that he says. So, uh, so he's just it's openly awesome. said that, which is yeah. that's quite a nice nugget. Very nonchalant as well. <laughs> yeah, just chucks that in there. But it's good for us as well, because now we can get excited about we know where this is going in terms of the next yeah, place man. we're going to visit and potentially how we get there. And when you think of the Project Berkeley stuff, where you see, well, he's a killer at the time, but Rio hanging off that train, for example. Can you imagine playing that That's, now? That is honestly, that is just leaps out to me as like a, a crazy moment that if we ever ever do get that to that point where that that actual scene happens, it's going to be like a mind blown experience because it's something that we saw so 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 long ago, and it just shows that there's still intentions there to that that is where Rio's heading that's part of his journey and you know it, th this was a cool answer I thought yeah um, to, to sort of get that confirmation and then he was yeah. showing us the fifth book which again thinking about it now sort of confuses me that it's called Baisha so they've got this document that doesn't kind of match up to the chapter tiles if you think about it because the fifth chapter tile is Guilin yet the fifth yeah. book here he's saying is Baisha so as he's shown us this book, he says this one is Baisha, which hasn't appeared yet, because obviously it was originally slated to be in Shimu 3, uh, which leads on to the next question quite well, and just make a, a mention that, that as they're Switch holding all five of the chapter books there, Legend of Akira books, and you may notice we've sort of covered up the monitors. They had like three monitors in the back of the room there, just, just in case there was anything on there. I don't think there was, but I just thought it was better to cover it up just in case yeah um, safety first and all yeah. of that the big way. screen actually did have the shemu dojo website on but i did it uh, yeah <laughs> when, when we walked in the shemu dojo website was on there so uh, ah. that, it's quite cool to see yeah that they've quite, been quite, checking us quite out proud of that, actually maybe, maybe veterans make sure we're <laughs> <laughs> make sure we're legit exactly oh dear uh, that's quite good i like that i really mm. like that that's cool Okay then, so it, like you say, it leads into the next question really, really well here. And the question is, Baisha was mentioned during the Shenmue 3 Kickstarter but ended up not being included in the game. Is there a possibility that this will turn up in the future? And he says, it depends how things go. And then he's pointing to the book. He says, this contains the lines for some of the cutscenes, which is interesting. Ooh. So if they are wanting like an easy game to make, Baisha seems like it's kind of already been built, at least in, you know, cutscene dialogue and storylines and stuff like that so that could be something that's a little bit more easy for them to make in the future than perhaps a chapter that hasn't even been started yet yeah because it's because it's already been taken from that novel into what is essentially now a script whereas i'm guessing the others they're going to have to take it from the novel which i'm guessing mm -hmm. it exists for all the chapters in some way shape or form they're then yeah. going to have to script that out in order to then make a game but i think that's where when you go back to Yu Suzuki talking about him wanting to work with screenwriters and all the rest of it i think that's where that could play in really really well if obviously we get to a shenmue 4 or, or beyond that i think that's where that that strength would really come into its own potentially assuming there's the budget for it of course and then funny enough we talk about the novelized bits <laughs> the next question is does a novelized version for it exist it does but that's top secret the novelized version is thicker so it's interesting because obviously each of these Legend of Akira books are various thicknesses and I think the Baisha one was probably the thinnest of all five. Um, interesting. So that's kind of him just sort of pointing out that the novelised version of Baisha is thicker than this book. Kind of, so. And that will come into I think some questions later on where yeah. he talks about how the novels are used in the game creation, but I'm, I won't spoil spoil that here. Um, but now we come on to the section around Shenmue 1 and 2. And again, there's some really interesting stuff in here. Um, but we open up um, with the question around the 25th anniversary of Shenmue 1. And it says, with the 25th anniversary of Shenmue 1 coming up in Japan this year, do you have any exciting plans or events that you're looking to do? Yeah, good introduction question, I thought. So, with the Shenmue Dojo and everyone in the community always supporting and thinking about Shenmue, and it being the 25th anniversary, we really should, but we don't have anything planned. We're just so busy, and it might be a little difficult to find the time. Which is is okay, actually, because it's nice to hear that they're so busy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. If they're busy, they're, they're making something, and mm. that's what we want. We want them to be making stuff, and... Mm -hmm. keeping themselves busy obviously i'd love them to do something official but yeah 
I completely understand if they're they're overwhelmed with with work, etc. So that's and I, I did I did cool. say that we we definitely celebrate it. <laughs> yeah, we 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 will definitely do something. We just don't quite know what yet, but we'll yep. work that out. And that leads into the next question, where James, you quite rightly said, yeah, we understand. We're oh, definitely yeah. going to yeah. celebrate it. And the next couple of questions are around the story. Uh, it says on the Japanese website for Shenmue One and Two, there are some character bios. Uh, the one for Ren talks about his Mongolian background. Could you tell us a little bit more about Ren's origins and his Mongolian tribe link? Now, I've picked this up in a video I did about Ren a little while ago. I think James, you tipped me off to this way back when, and yeah. you can see on the screen now. There's the translation from the Japanese website that really goes into. Ren's background a little bit and Yuzuzuki's answer is quite interesting as well. Yeah, well, like you say, Matt, I I can't remember how we we discovered these, but we were just I was just looking. I think I was like saving images and stuff from the different websites to make sure that the, you know, if they ever went offline, we'd still got that content. And we were translating the the description of these characters. Landy Landy's got like a, a really interesting bio on this website as well, but Ren's. Finding that the the back of his jacket is actually one of those Quilin beast things, the, the Quilin, mm -hmm. Kirin, Kir it says on here. Um, but yeah, that that line there that no one in the heavens knows his true ident identity, but it seems that he's actually from the Mongolian horse tribe. And if you think back to those pictures of like Ren on a horse and stuff like that, it mm. kind of makes sense. Um, really interesting. So yeah, we asked you Suzuki what this meant. Bit of a deep cut really in Shemu lore, but yeah. I thought it was interesting to try and find out from him, but he said he, he can't say too much about it because he's not yet sure exactly how secret we have to keep this information. I don't want to give anything away. It kind of put me on the spot. It might be a spoiler, so I don't think I can say sorry, which is really interesting because like, because he's so hesitant to express what this actually means in Ren's bio, it must mean that it means something or yeah, like the, the future I, yeah. of his character or something there must be something to his background um otherwise he just straight up say like oh you know that was an old idea and it's not there anymore or you know ren's just a street thug where it just seems like there is something more to ren's character that we don't know, quite know yet yeah and then it's also interesting that, that sega japan who obviously built that website included that information and it mm -hmm. very much flew under the radar and then yu suzuki's answer to that is one of he wants to keep his class very close to his chest yeah which says to me there's going to hopefully be more exploration around ren's origins and maybe that comes into play in later chapters which would, would be really cool to see and then hopefully that artwork that you talked about with ren on the horse mm -hmm. comes into play which would be amazing to see that coming on then to the next question uh we talk about again it's, this might also be a spoiler but we get an interesting <laughs> answer to this one it's about the era and environment behind uh, these characters. So Shenhua has a baby and her parents. We are interested in the location of this scene. So for anybody who isn't familiar with this, this is the cutscene towards the end of Shenmue 2, where you see a baby Shenhua under a Shenmue tree with her parents in sort of quite regal looking um, outfits. Uh, they look like they're part potentially of royalty in China. And his answer again is, um, pretty pretty interesting yeah so at first it sounded like he wasn't going to give anything away but he actually does so he says the same thing applies here as to giving too much away but what i can say is that the game differs from the story outline of the original novel so the novel is used as a reference when creating the scenes for the game and contains various plot lines i don't know exactly how this will turn out in the game but in terms of what i am envisioning the location of this scene is liuang it's an ancient capital. So just to break up the answer here a second, that is cool to hear because we have always speculated if this is just an old version of Shenfua's house, because mm -hmm. the way that the the sort of work the scene into the narrative, it's like Shenfua looking at a tree with a swing underneath, and then the flashback is Shenfua on the swing under the tree. So it the the way that they tell it in the game, it, I don't know if it's it's purposely trying to fool you into thinking it's the same location but again this is possibly the first time that Yusuzuki has actually said for sure now that the flashback scene is Lu Yuang so it's a completely different area he says something else I'd like to mention is that before Virtual Fighter RPG we made a prototype called the old man in the peach tree that became Virtual Fighter RPG which in turn became Shenmue the setting of the old man in the peach tree prototype was Lu Yuang 
So the setting for China I had in mind at the beginning was Lu Yuang. So yeah, really interesting that this location that a lot of Shenmue fans have speculated a, a ton over the years is still quite integral to the, the story of Shenmue, it seems. Yeah, and it's if it's been thought about from essentially what is 1994, 1995, to yeah. hear that it's still in the thought process now, what, 30 years on, is insane in itself. So I'd be yeah. interested to see how, that, how they weave that in. It then leads on to the next question, which answers a few little questions around some of the continuity in Shenmue 3 as well. So there's a bit of crossover here. And you say in Shenmue 2, there is a tapestry of Luang in Shenhua's house. Yeah, and he says that it's the place of her ancestors. So that kind of, again, confirms the flashback. Uh, yeah. Her ancestors there and in the, in the background there, her parents. Something to do with Lu Yuang anyway. And then this then leads into the next question around some of the continuity. So uh, in Shenmue 3, the tapestry was replaced with a picture of Bailu Village. Uh, was there a reason for that change? Yeah, so this was interesting. This was something we kind of wanted to understand why they would replace this tapestry if it was such an important part of the game, um, why, why they would completely replace it. And Yu Suzuki flat out said that that's just something that resulted from the game making process. And we know games change, they cut things, they add things in, and actually the, the image that you put together there is very, very, very clear. There's a clear difference between the two. Um, but then it then comes, I think his answer in the next question mm -hmm. is very interesting. And this goes way, way back to the planning of Shenmue 2. And again, I think this has never really been spoken. I don't think this has been spoken about before in the context of the way they were planning it. So the, the, this answer is really interesting. So you've then gone back and said, look, that the, it, there isn't any particular meaning behind the change. And then he comes back with a really interesting answer here. Yeah, so he says not really. So... I mean, it's strange that they would make the change in the first place, but again, he's, you know, this is this is the reason why. So he says, during the development of Shenmue 2, originally the plan had been to include Liu Wang, you see, but portraying Liu Wang turned out not to be so feasible due to the increased content that it would have required. So in order to keep things manageable, Shenmue 2 was just kept, kept to Guilin. He kind of had to pare it back a little. Share. Uh, interesting. That's very, very interesting because that... Again, I don't. I could be wrong, but I don't think he's ever mentioned in interviews gone by that actually Liu Ang was going to be in Shenmue 2 and they had to step it back. Yeah, well, how, how mental would that have been that you've been to Hong Kong, Kowloon, Guilin, Bailu Village, etc., and then all the way up until Liu Ang? So would Liu Ang have originally been the next destination or would there have been something else in between as well? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, it's it's insane, isn't it? Unless the um, flashback where they actually created that location of Liu Wang could have been continued even further. You know, like a flashback that turns into like a playable section in Liu Wang or maybe more of that. Mm. You took the words right out of my mouth there. I was going to say, do you think it could have been a playable section? And, and that, that is one way they could have done it. Can you imagine, though, going, like you say, going through Hong Kong, Kowloon, Guilin, the game would have been like 25 discs it would have been huge it would have been insane wouldn't it <laughs> I think they probably made the right decision not to cram that much in I think it would have felt maybe potentially rushed I also wonder as well whether that changed when they had a feeling not just that they had to pair it back in terms of getting the game out but also that the Dreamcast was on dodgy mm. foundations for want of a better expression and sort True. of refocused a little bit potentially I, I, I'm guessing I don't know and if you think they had to cut out things already, like Meow Village and some of, some of the cut content that was in originally planned for Shenmue 2, <laughs> outside of this discovery, and that they also planned to put Liu Wang in as well, which is crazy. And then the next question is a follow-up to that is, is there a possibility that we will see Liu Wang, Liu Wang in the future? Yeah, so this is a, a sort, somewhat strange, I think. He says that depends on how many more chances there will be to make a Shamu game. So, how do you take that answer, Matt? Because is he is he is he sort of saying that like the next Shamu game, a Shamu Four, would feature Liu Yuang then, or are we talking even further in the future? I don't know because if you look at the chapter cards, it would suggest it was further on than what's been what he's already revealed in this interview. Mm. But as we know. It's interchangeable. 
So it could yeah. easily appear in a potentially a Shenmue 4, or it could be in a, in a fifth game. It could just not appear at all. Um, True. By the sound of it. I don't know if he's quite... It sounds like he hasn't quite settled on how that's going to, going to work, but later on in the interview, which we'll come on to, yeah. he talks a little bit about some of the other content and how that could be experienced. And I wonder if that would apply here potentially as well. But again, I'm not, not going to spoil it. We're going to hit the yeah. next question. <clears throat> and this is sort of the last couple of questions around the Shenmue 1 and 2 bit. And this one, again, it's quite an interesting one. Um, so cast your minds back to the Game Jam beta. Must be a good couple of years ago now. And you showed him a screenshot of his character <laughs> model from the Game Jam build of Shenmue 2. And you were wondering, had he seen it? It's from the Shenmue 2 prototype. Yeah, so this was just a curiosity if, you know, this sort of stuff just passes the, the team by and they don't even realise. And I, I thought it might be fun to sort of ask him outright if he's he's actually seen this model of, of Yu Suzuki in the game of Shenmue 2. So he says, yes, I have. And he thought that it was something that had been created recently. So, like, obviously not aware that this was an original file on an original build of a disc of Shenmue 2. Um, so... We, we sort of came back and said that obviously it was discovered recently but it was actually part of the game files and and then Yu Suzuki replies that oh it's probably just someone's prank then so that may have been the, well obviously he said that he had seen it but that, that was probably the first time he actually realised that <laughs> this um, Yu Suzuki model some, some dev had made back in the day I guess which is quite funny which is mad that didn't know it was there yeah somewhere deep in the in the depths of the game's files so that's that's quite a nice little little tidbit and we'll put the links in the uh, youtube description where you can find all i uh, find out all about that that game jam base you can actually click on the, the photograph as well of Yu suzuki there the character model i have tried to link some of the images if, if possible ah super so there you go click the link and click the photo and it should take you away into that section so then that brings us to the end of the Shenmue 1 and 2 stuff and it pulls us in to, I think, which is quite a meaty section around Shenmue 3. And the first question opens up with saying that fans are really yeah, really delighted with the Kickstarter being announced for Shenmue 3 and love the elements such as the save Shenmue Hall, uh, which created that special connection with the fans. With Shenmue 3 now approaching its fifth anniversary, which is insane in itself, is how crazy. do you feel about the project's journey and outcome now that you can look back on it? Yeah, so like you say, the section on Shenmue 3 is quite meaty. I, I feel like Shenmue 3 was released and no one's particularly asked Yu Suzuki too many questions about the storyline and that, that sort of stuff. It feels like a lot of the interviews kind of ended at 2019. I know we have had a, a few interviews with Yu Suzuki since, but um, I thought it might be nice to sort of probe him some for some story content answers for some of the things that happen in Shenmue 3. So this first question just sort of tried to get a, a feel of how Yu Suzuki felt about the, the project yeah, now that yeah. it's been and done. So he says, well, for me, Shenmue 1, 2 and 3 are game projects that are finished. So what I think about are the next games like 4 or 5. Although a remake of the first two games using something like Unreal Engine 5 might be fun if we had a partner <laughs> for it. <laughs> so that's a, quite a, a, a cool statement that he's He's, he's, he's also interested in a remake because remember that IGN interview he, he says like oh, you know be nice to do a Shenmue 0 or a Shenmue 4 and now he's talking about a remake as well so um, <laughs> hopefully we get one of those three things and then yeah. interestingly he says that yesterday he was watching a YouTube gameplay video of Watch Shenmue where you have to find Mr. Yukawa and it made him want to try remaking it with Unreal Engine 5 because it had it, its own flavour so we've got Shenmue 0, a remake of Shenmue, Shenmue 4, and possibly a remake of what Shenmue on the cars, Matt. How do you feel about that? I mean, I'll take any Shenmue content <laughs> we can get. Um, Imagine an Unreal 5 engine version of what Shenmue, that'd be crazy. It'd be absolutely insane. But actually thinking, and I know there's been talk in the community around the idea and the feasibility around a full-scale remake, which I can understand the logic behind it. It's a massive risk, but mm. if they could get it off the ground and do it well, modernize things, really encompass maybe even Shenmue 1 and 2 into one game, and then sort of give people an entry point, 
it could potentially work. We talk about Shenmue Zero later in this interview. I also have the theory that that could work if it you know, had the, 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 the Yakuza Zero effect. He's got lots of ideas, I guess, which is brilliant. And I like yeah. that. It's then which one of these ideas can he get past that stage into a full scale production? That's, I think, the next stage. And maybe something like a watch Shenmue or a small tech demo of Dabuita in Unreal could be that first step for him. I I, I don't know. A good, good point, Mark. Like if they are looking for a partner for something like a remake, if they did create Watch Shenmue, which is like a small bite sized chunk of what that remake would become, and then sort of show that to potential partners in the future, just so they can get a good idea of what uh, the idea might be behind this sort of remake, and if it looks quality because it's an unreal five uh, for example that could be a good stepping stone for them to get a, a project like a remake off the ground i guess we just have to see don't we and also it then depends on on sega who obviously own the ip and there's other complications around it that i'll come on to actually in this interview as well so i'll, I'll park that part that thought for a minute we then sort of pop into the next sort of, this is a follow-up question more than anything else and you, you say it certainly fun, would be fun. I'd quite like to see it. With yep. many years of development between Shenmue 2 and 3, it must have been a challenge to keep track of the story and other details from earlier games. What process did you use to help preserve continuity between the two games? Yeah, Which I thought was a good question just to sort of understand mm. what they did before they you know, went deep into the story of Shenmue 3, for example, if how much of the continuity is going to be retained, what, what was the process there. And Yusuke came back and said that we used the 11 chapter novelized work as a reference point when creating the scenarios for the new game, so that avoided uncertainties. The novel has the complete story you see. He kind of is saying that the novel version of you know what they've got here is the entire saga, which yeah. is pretty crazy. And then you sort of go back to ask it, did it reduce the amount of time they needed to replay the games? And it was, his answer was quite straightforward here. He said that it wasn't necessary to go back and play them um, to check certain things, but I get the impression it probably sped things up a little bit. Yeah, Is that fair? I thought so. I mean, you'd hope that they got, or, or at least gone through both the games with a fine tooth comb just to sort of retain a lot of the, the continuity, because I'm a sucker for continuity, really, which is why I wanted to ask that question, just to get a feel of like what they are, are actually doing to, to keep games consistent and not kind of miss a, an important story beat um, or, or something that we feel is important anyway. So from an analytical point of view, they it sounds like they've got the content in front of them in terms of the novel they've got the games yeah. so in terms of Shenmue 3 obviously we know there's certain continuity things he's answered some of that in terms of Shenhua's house the tapestry for example we got a straight answer from that and that's brilliant um, but there were other continuity issues in there there was a lot of recapping of old information from Shenmue 2 I, I do wonder what the trigger for that was whether it was a deliberate thing to recap things that happened previously to catch people up I know you had the digest video, but whether that was a thing, or simply that the writers they had didn't really go too far away from the novels and almost sort of rehashed them. I don't know. I'm 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 just being a little bit sort of yeah. not critical. It's the wrong word, but I want to sort of analyse the story content of Shenmue through in the context of the answers that we got. Yeah, no, I do, I do get that, Matt. It's like it's kind of like potentially back in the day for Shenmue two, like your big reveal is like. <gasps> Zhao Shilming, that that's the name of Landy's father or whatever, and Long mm. Sun Zhao, you know, all these, these sort of things. Yeah, where they, yeah. they kind of make a big deal of that at the end of Shemu 3, as though it's introducing new information to the player. Perhaps that just happened to have been in that part of the novel. And when they were creating Shemu 2, for example, they were taking elements from like future things, and someone thought that, oh, well, that, that reveal would be a really good reveal right now. And then, depending on the continuity wise, they are that process that they're going through when they're creating new Shemu games. Like you say, maybe because some of the original team members aren't there to say, well, you know, that that line's already been used in Shemu 2, like that big reveal is, you know, perhaps they sort of glanced over that without thinking. And then in the novelized version of this chapter that they're, they're currently reading through to design the game around, it says, oh, Long Sun Zhao is Landy's, you know, real name or whatever. And it's, yeah, it's kind yeah. of like, oh, you know, this has to be a, a big moment in the game and then obviously when it is it doesn't really hit because 
it's not a big moment. It's already been told in Shenmue 2. So, yeah, there's, there's a few little disparages between potential things there that could have been fine-tuned to, like, better introduce things or better um, create that sort of big moment that doesn't kind of fall flat because it's not a big moment. Um, yeah, and it's not... And again, I, I put, sort of put a preface in front of it that I don't want to come across as being overly critical. It's just I find it quite interesting yeah, in, in the context of, of, of the novels being there and what was actually produced in the game. And I, and I still stand by. I think it would be helpful to have somebody on the team who, who knows those games inside out, who can go, right, at point X in Shenmue 2, this was done. So yeah. actually in Shenmue 3, 4, you don't need to do this. You need to push it forward by doing what whatever. And mm. then then I think you can just drive that story forward again. But again, also, I think coming into screenwriters and having people that I think are experts in that area would also help benefit a fourth, fifth game in in that point of view. I'm going to move on because we've, we've, yeah, I don't want to do Shem, you know, Shemmy 3. I keep talking about that we should, should move on from it, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to practice what I preach and, and move straight on into the next question. Um, and this one's very interesting, and it's about the uh, motion capture of Shenmue 3. And you asked, could you tell us about the motion capture process for Shenmue 3? We heard it was all done in-house. Yeah, so we kind of had a, an outline of an idea of like where this question, this next series of questions was going to go. We were looking to like see like if they were going to sort of expand upon this in a Shenmue 4, for example. So start a question here. Yu Suzuki's answer says, not all of it was carried out here. Some was also outsourced. It's, uh, yeah, interesting. I'm not sure if we knew that, did we? No, we, we're under the presumption that it was all done at Wise now. It does make yeah. sense they would have outsourced some of it. I'd like to I, I know what they outsourced and what they didn't outsource. I, I don't know, but mm -hmm. it's interesting they did manage to outsource some of it. And then coming on to the next question, you said, was the in-house capture done in that area? You're pointing to a nearby room. Yeah, so obviously we got this image that we were actually showing to you, Suzuki, from... Um, switch his laptop just to sort of give him a bit of context of why we were asking that. So obviously it looks like this motion capture in this image is in WiseNet Studios. And I was actually looking through the window of the meeting room and it kind of resembled this image that I was looking at here. So obviously the building that we're in, but you know, these floors must look at, you know, quite identical. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, you know, might it have been over there that you were doing this motion capture? And he actually turned around and he, he, he thought about it for a moment and he's like, mm, I don't think so. I think it was done on the floor below us. So, um, yeah, obviously they, they had two floors, didn't they, when they were working yes, on Shamu 3? They did, because obviously the amount of staff they'd have had working on that project. And yeah. I, I like how you sort of led into the Shamu 4 motion capture yeah. question here, asking essentially, would the mocap for Shamu 4 be handled differently? Yeah, so we've sort of like ex trying to get an answer that may lead into like oh yeah we'd like to introduce throw moves again or whatever you know that sort of yeah, thing if yeah, we can yeah. do it differently so you suzuki said that with shemu 3 we did do a lot of the motion capture using a magnetic detection system and motion capture technology has advanced now so for shemu 4 we would probably use optical detection which means nothing to me i don't know if that's yeah i haven't got a clue you know, massive technology, technology advancement or whatever. He says he, we would do the prototyping here and then outs outsource for the final. Um, there are things that still need to be done in-house, though. When striking someone, they are going to get hit, right? But I want to see that reaction when they get hit. This was hilarious, actually. So what he was doing, I'll try and kind of do the same sort of thing in, in the picture here, but he, he physically, like, put his fist like this. And he was crunching off his face like this, right in front of us. <laughs> like, this is this is mental. Yu Suzuki's like doing this, so he's demonstrating a slow motion punch to his own cheek and humorously dis distorts his face, sort of like that. And he said, actually hitting someone would be dangerous, so he can't use full contact during motion capture. So we create those kind of effects in house using manual or physically based rendering, and this is what he wants. So again, he gives us a second demonstration. He, this is the kind of thing that he wants to see. So I guess when you think about, say, I'm, I'm trying to think of like games that may do that similar sort of thing. Maybe Mortal Kombat is probably a little bit too brutal, but you know, when you can physically <laughs> see the yeah, yeah, yeah. the punch of um, he kind of wants to show, I guess, the, the force of what a character punching someone in the face would look like. So that sort of distortion is perhaps this technolo technology advancement that he's, he's talking about where it might be easier to sort of 
to sh to show that now without physically punching someone in the face, you've got rules to be able to create something that looks like someone's punching something in the face. And uh, yeah, I made a note there that it well, it, it caused a bit of laughter in the room, which was <laughs> which it did. We were all sort of laughing at that. Just we we I, I wish that was a moment where I was like, oh, do I ask you Suzuki if it's okay if I take a photo of him doing this thing with his face? But I thought it was a bit maybe. Could seem a bit disrespectful to put that on the internet there. He says he can sort of punched up punching face. <laughs> Shows he's got a good sense of humour though. Yeah, wow. I mean, and, and, honestly, uh... he was so lovely and just so comfortable around us. You know, he, he was cracking jokes like this, and I know it kind of like had to be translated by Joel into English. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. But just to sort of feel comfortable to to crack a couple of jokes, he's is quite a humorous guy actually, which is uh, nice. And I think it strikes the tone of the interview from sort of the, the, the sort of discussion we've had so far that actually, while it's quite, you know, for the dojo, it's a big deal, this this thing, and it's a massive deal meeting Yu Suzuki and, and doing an interview. Actually, it sounds like it was conducted in quite a relaxed, informal way, for want yeah, of a better word. It really was, man. And considering it was like my first in-person interview like that, that just helped so much that I, I didn't feel like I was under pressure or like if I, I screwed up a asking a question someone was you know it was going to make me look unprofessional um just everything just felt so relaxed and it was just a, a nice environment to actually do this interview in without feeling pressured you know like you see like when we went to monaco and these kind of in, in, in interviews going on on the stage like having that that interview in front of all that audience would be absolutely terrifying for me so like in this environment I, I just felt so comfortable, which is, uh, you know, just, uh, again, it, it's just expressing my thanks that, that that was the case. And Yu Suzuki and Joel just made us feel so so comfortable in that in that environment. And it, it shows in the answers that we get, I think, as we go through. Mm. Moving moving away, and then we're going to talk about a little bit about the Shenmue 3 Kickstarter. Um, we see a stretch reward for Bailu Village called the Magic Maze, and a development video showing clips boulders falling onto Rio and there's pictures on the site if you want to see them uh, could you tell us what was planned for this yeah so we're trying to sort of dig deep into what would have been planned beyond the budget of Shenmue 3 a little bit um, so he says the magic maze was to have been a procedurally generated maze I don't remember how off and what was planned but it's something that could be applied to a forest area or equally to a rocky area it's something that can't be made completely random as that would be difficult to design around, but in general the shape of the forest would be created using splines, for example, and realistic foliage would be generated automatically. So kind of similar to what actually they did for the the, the forest segment of Shemu mm. 2, how they sort of compressed everything by being able to procedurally generate the, the forest on the fly there. Uh, I think that's kind of a similar thing he's sort of saying there. And it also reminds me a little bit of the uh, the rooms in Kowloon. They're, mm -hmm. they're, oh, they're generated as that door opens, aren't they? Which yep. again, at the time, the technology for that was insane. Um, so it sounds like they were trying to utilise at least some of that idea for something like that. Obviously, it didn't come to fruition, unfortunately. And it comes into the next question where you ask, was there a particular event planned for the Magic Maze? He says, yes, but I don't recall the details. But the, there would have been something planned for it. And that's interesting. Like, I'd, I'd love to know what that would have been. Like, for example, when you think back to the Kickstarter, you can see um, Rio looking over, like the the two loos, for example. So, could there have been mm -hmm. a section where he's having to dodge rocks to get to the two loos? Or I, I know I'm throwing things out there because I know it's all been, it was in a test element at that point in time. Yeah. I wonder where they'd have put it. I don't know. Yeah, would have been interesting. So then, coming straight into Again, another sort of question around Shenmue 3 development. Uh, there was other sort of mini games that were cut, and you make reference to. There was a mini game called Ring Toss and the remote control forklift and boats. Again, there's the picture from which was from a Kickstarter update. I can't remember which one, but we'd have covered it in our one of the Kickstarter update shows that we've done. Were any of these originally going to be playable? Yeah. So if you remember, there was also like music files found in the the Shemu yes. through files that was like RC forklift and RC boat. So they they had a few extra mini games. So yeah, we were curious what actually happened to these. And Yusuke was actually so he was pointing at the board 
on the, the screenshot here that we, we showed him. And he, he was saying, wasn't this one in there? And then he says, I, I guess not since you're asking about it. So it must have been close, whatever they were working with the ring toss. Maybe he was thinking, right, like maybe pale toss or mm. a, a similar sort of mini game because they did create quite a few different pale toss esque mini games. So maybe you just assumed that the ring toss one would, would have been part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then you sort of you come onto this here. So there's a ring toss board in the game, but it's not, not playable. Mm. And then he kind of started to remember. He's like, yeah, we, we started making it, but it must have been dropped partway through. And then he was telling us a little bit about the forklift. He says, for that, of the forklift game, there was even a proper engine inside the vehicle that could be controlled. And you had to collect balloons and carry them all to a certain spot. <laughs> so that, that that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's interesting. I'd be quite interested to play that. Actually. Yeah, me too. Um, and then the next question around that is, was there a working prototype created for the remote control forklift game? Which he said, yes, there was. Yes, and there I was, know, yeah. I want to know where that prototype ended up because I want to play it. Yeah, but well, if I you think about it, they, they created the full-on forklift experience, didn't they, with a the part-time job? So, I mean, I mean, could that have just been miniaturized a little bit and Maybe. turned into a bit of a game? Maybe that that's what the, pr the prototype... It reminds me of, you know, when you go to, like, an, an amusement park and you put a pound coin and those yeah, 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 those yeah. steering wheel things and you've got, like, the little RC cars and stuff like that that you can crash into, which... That, that sort of thing is, is what that kind of reminded me of. So whether or not that would have worked in Bailey Village, but I don't know. I don't know. I also wonder whether they took that sort of basis from that remote control forklift game and made it into the, the forklift yeah, job, yeah. potentially. Could have been the other way around, right? Like they, they started off with an RC forklift and then they were like, well, why don't we just turn this into a full-fledged forklift part-time job mini game? Maybe that's what they Makes decided to do instead, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Now, the next question is, I think, very interesting. This has been a this is topic a of debate over the Shenmue community since Shenmue 3's release. And you go and ask, uh, there's a Shenmue tree outside Shenhua's house. There's also a large tree in the area called Tanari Spring. Is that also a Shenmue tree? Yeah, so if you remember in the game, in the English, I think they do call it a Shenmue tree. They do. And I believe Switch was saying that in the Japanese, it's not really clear that it's a Shemu tree, it's just a, another tree kind of thing in the, in the Japanese dialogue. So that's hence this question. And Yusuke said, yes, it is. And there are also some in Liyuang, which is interesting. So mm. there's not just one Shemu tree, the, the one in Turnery Spring is. And then that there's some in Liyuang, which kind of makes sense thinking of the one in the flashback as well, that now we know that that yeah. is Liyuang. That is one of the Shemu trees as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then he, he goes to draw some Chinese characters on, a, on yeah. a piece of paper, which I find really interesting. This is interesting. I mean, he has done this a couple of times in the past. I don't know. It's not really new information for Shemu fan because this is how the flashback goes. It's sort of told like this, that these Chinese characters are pronounced Shamu, and that's how Shemu is written. And then the second character of the, the Chinese kanji means tree, uh, which is kind of how it gets its name. And if that is replaced by the other character for flower, it becomes Shenhua. So that, that's kind of what the parents actually say in that flashback. The Shenmue tree is in full bloom. You know, what shall we name her? The, the, the leaf's called Shenhua. Why don't we name her Shenhua kind of thing, don't we? And that's kind of where that comes from. But to see him actually write it out um, is pretty cool. He, 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 oh, yeah. he had like these bits of paper that he was like scribbling little notes on for us to show us that you'll see a couple more of later in the interview. Brilliant. I like that. I like that a lot. And then so the final question around this is uh, in a cut scene, Rio uh, talks about a special connection with the tree outside the Hazuki Dojo. And then you ask if that tree is Shenmue tree. Yeah. So this, this, I don't think we actually had this written on the interview, but with him saying that this is a tree, that's a tree, the one in Liu Yuang's tree. I was like, this is like a great time to ask him to, to get a clear answer now. Is the Hazuki Dojo tree a Shemu tree? And then he said, that's just a cherry tree. <laughs> so it isn't, basically. So completely debunked that one, but yeah. that's, that's absolutely fine. It's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is going into a little bit of spoiler territory. Uh, there's obviously the scene in Shemu 3 with Yang Lang. Uh, he's interrogated by Shenhua. And you outright ask him, what did she do to make him talk? Yeah, and Yusuke just smiles and says that's a secret, so I guess we still don't know whether we'll, we'll ever know, I don't know. <laughs> I hope we do, I, I really do, because 
Yeah. The fact that he was screaming by the end of that, I'd love to know what she did to him. Uh, the next question, again, we're in sort of spoiler territory perhaps a little bit but again something that was discussed and there was also the translation error with the scroll at the end of mm. Shenmue 3 here uh, on the scroll found in the bell tower in Bailu village there is an image of Niawu what is the reason that Niawu is on that scroll yeah so a bit of context behind this question obviously after the Niawu image you've got the cliff temple depicted or you know the, these trees that might be where the, the treasure is hidden but the Niawu image to be on such an ancient scroll doesn't really have any answers to it if you know what i mean like it kind of feels more like it's just a gamified way of sending the characters to niawi right it's like forcing oh, oh because it's on mm. the scroll you must go to niawi but actually nothing really happens in niawi that means anything in regarding to like this ancient scroll so that was the, the reasoning behind the question is like why actually is niawi on the scroll and then I don't know if you can kind of work out what he means here, Matt. It's a little bit confusing, but he says the Chiyu men had to be prevented from finding out about Niawu's connection with the two mirrors. So a hint was left in the scroll. So I don't know if that is an answer or not. It had me thinking that perhaps in Shemu as a game format, maybe the Cliff Temple is actually still in Niawu. Like, instead of having Lu Yuang or the Shaolin Temple or Shanghai or, you know, another location where this Cliff Temple is, um, potentially it could just be an extension of Niawu. I don't know. I was I was trying to think, like, what, what he could actually mean by this. I'm not sure. And without, I think, the true ending that they wanted for Shenmue 3, I don't think... It doesn't quite line up. Hmm. I can't, I can't interpret that in a way that will make sense. If I, if, yeah, I'm a little yeah. confused by that. Chi Yuman had to be prevented from finding out about Niawu's connection with the two mirrors, so a hint was left in the scroll. But then in Niawu, it doesn't really make a connection with the mirrors, does it? it I know you lose the Phoenix mirror, obviously, to Niao Sun. You've got the fake mirror that Ren throws at Landy. But there's no real reference to the mirrors in Niawu. So I wonder, is that something they may have left out by, you know, just by sheer virtue of time? Mm. Or do they, do they, they, they think there's some sort of a connection to Niawu? Um, the the fact that, it. fact that Niao Sun's there or, um, you know, Landy's castle's there, I don't know. Mm, I'm not sure about that one. Maybe we'll find out in a, in a later Shenmue game, but it's, I don't think that's immediately clear in, in my mind, at least. So I'd be interested to see what other people think about that. Aren't yeah, well. leave your comments below on that one, guys. Be yeah, do. See what your, quite, your quite interpretation of that is. Mm -hmm. uh, next bit. Uh, at the end of Shenmue 2, there's a cutscene in the stone pit in which Shenhua reads the letter left for her by her father, tells her to find the proof. Is this scroll, I like this question, is this scroll from the bell tower the proof that he was referring to? Yeah, because again, fan debates, right? This is the proof of the scroll. It's something we've been debated about. And, and Yu Suzuki actually says that he's not talking about the scroll. He's referring to her meeting Ryo and accompanying him to solve the mystery together. Mm, so again, make of that as what you will. So we sort of followed up with a little short question here, just asking, so this proof hasn't been found yet. And Yusuke sort of agreed, like he says, that that's right. So we haven't actually discovered the proof yet that uh, Shenfor's father was talking about. She's very, very interesting as to what that proof is or isn't going to be. Um, yeah, because that makes sense. It's a theory that they found the proof, of the scroll, and they need where to go. But actually, they haven't found anything yet by the sounds of it. They've just been told where to go. Yeah, but then now that they've found Shenfor's father, could he not tell him? <laughs> Well, you'd hope so, wouldn't you? You think he'd probably know, but yeah. So, what's maybe that proof that's... you're talking about, uh, Yuan? Yes, <laughs> Mister Yuan. Maybe we'll find out in Shenmue Four. Um, this next question and the next few questions sort of touch on, I think, some of the law streams that you've done and the research mm -hmm. around that. And I know we've talked about this in um, in streams and podcasts, etc. As well, it says here that Shenmue Three touches on the Emperor and his commissioning of the mirrors. Is the Emperor based on the real life Emperor at the time? Uh, Emperor P uh, Puyi of the Qing Dynasty, the so-called Last Emperor. 
yeah, really just something personal. I wanted to find out if the game was based on this emperor that, because it seems to, to 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 be mentioned a few times in the game. The important thing is that the the emperor would have only been four at the time. So I just kind of wanted a bit of confirmation beyond that. So Yusuke said, yes, he is the model on which the game's emperor is based. I mean, that's in key, very much in keeping with, with Shenmue and the sort of the, yep. using the real life aspects to build into the game. So I, that makes a lot of sense. You've got a photo there of the three-year-old Puyi in 1909. And then the follow-up question is, in real life, at the time of the Miracle Mission in 1910, he would only have been four years old. Is that the case in the game as well? Yeah, interesting answer from Yusuke. He says he doesn't recall this precise age, I guess he means at this time, but the dates and so on are something that we carefully researched on our side. So in that sense then, he is four years old in the game if they mm -hmm. carefully researched it, because you know we've sort of found that information out since then, that the Emperor at the time of this, this event happening in 1910, he would have been four years old. So that's an interesting point, because if you think that the Emperor... By de you know that the envoy came by decree of the emperor that the, the characters in mm -hmm. Shenmue Three say, and Oishi San in the antique shop says he once read a book about the emperor, you know, wanting these phoenix and dragon mirrors being made, and then it kind of adds an extra layer when you actually think that this guy, this emperor, is only four years old <laughs> when he's coming up with these sort of demands. So um, yeah, hopefully that that's something that they touch upon in the future. Would be good to see if they can expand on that as to who really sort of commissioned it but we'll hopefully come on to that in another game. The next question, quite a straightforward answer, but again, sort of reaffirms, I think, what was discussed a little bit earlier. So in the ending scene of the game, Ryo leaves Niawu by boat together with Wen and Shenhua and her father. Where are they heading to next? This is a good answer, I thought, because, the, again, I know we did get conf confirmation of this in one of the early questions, but Yu Suzuki out, out, outright saying that the next destination that the, the characters are heading to is Shuzo. So there we are, that mm. rock solid proof. We found the proof of where we're going next. <laughs> Maybe the proof is in Shuzo. It might well be. Mm. Um, then the next question sort of is about the story DLC. And Zhang shows up in Niawu uh, and you ask, is he there on the orders of Yuanzu to watch over Rio? Or is there a coincidence that he was there when Rio was there? Yeah, I thought this was just a fun question to ask if there was any real design motive behind Zhang showing up in Shemu 3. And Yusuzuki said that Zhang is a bit of a fan favourite, so I really just wanted to include him in the DLC. And then we all sort of laughed at that answer because it was like, <laughs> you know, as though as though there was no real reasoning behind Zhang being there other than that mm. he's a sort of a fan favourite. But then he did reply after that more seriously that, of course, you know, he would have been sent there from the instructions of Yuan Zhu. Now that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very, very interesting. Why would Zhu send Zhang there? Now, going back to the Shenmue Master interviews, it talks about that Yuanda Zhu isn't all that he seems, that he's not necessarily to be trusted. So what's his motive here? Why is he sending Zhang on to monitor the situation with the Chi Yu men, Rio? Too convenient, isn't it? Yeah, very, very convenient. What's What's going on there? And hopefully in a fourth game, we might get more around Zoo and what his motivations are. I know there's a theory that Zoo is also Tente, and that's been talked about for years. So that's that's quite an interesting answer that we've got confirmation that Zoo was the one that commissioned that, that to happen. And then the last question of, of the Shenmue 3 stretch is, again, I think this is really interesting in itself mm, yep. and might feed the answer can feed into a video i did a little while ago but you ask i'm showing a picture here can we expect the story of Ewing and zimming from starting shenmue 2 to be continued in future games yeah I'd, i'm not quite sure how to take this answer whether it's a good thing or a bad thing but he says it might be too much of a stretch to be able to include it in the main story but possibly as something like a side story which when i first heard that answer i was a little bit disappointed like you know because the relationship between Shuing and Zimming was like such a big pivotal moment in the, the storyline of Shenmue 2 and it felt like, especially with Ryo having the half of the pendant still in his inventory, that there was a, a very much a big reveal going to happen in the future of Zimming. And maybe there is, maybe this is what Yusuzuki means, that the actual relationship between Shuing and Zimming could be something like a side story. But it's 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 
I don't know how do how do you see that answer, Matt? Is that is that Yu Suzuki saying that they haven't got time to cover Zimming and Shuing again, or do you think he's he's talking specifically about the relationship between them that could be a side story rather than them appearing in the game again? I I would question whether he's got time within the resources and the games he's got to explore that fully. Yeah. So I wonder whether there will still be some element of it in there, given the chapter cards as well and assuming type figures in there. You've got the side story comics, which I mentioned, I think Ali mentioned this in a, in a stream, I did a video on it, that actually they could do some of this through um, through side story comics if they really wanted to sort of build that up into a Shenmue 4, cover some of that lore nice and early. You could charge a few quid for it. We'd buy it. You make a little bit of money. Happy days for everybody, right? Yeah. But so that could work in that sense. I wonder whether you'll get as much of that background in sort of in the game potentially. They might have some flashbacks. They might have little bits and pieces. But if Zimming appears, I think it'd be much more focused on the here and now with little tidbits of what happened hmm. with with him and and Zewing. And it's intimated in the chapter cast that Ewing returns as well. So how yeah. they play that into it is another question. Um, but I think they will probably spend more time on the here and now. They can't not use that pendant. It would make no sense in the story point of this juncture to just sort of wreck on it because it's there. It's a massive point. This is an inventory. It's a massive, massive point. You've still got the photos as well. I, I, I... They, if they retcon that, that's a big storyline they retcon. I think what they'll end up doing is play, focusing it very much on what Rio's doing at that precise moment in time and maybe filling some gaps through flash, flashbacks and maybe some side story comics as well, which, again, would if they wanted to build hype for a Shenmue 4, they could start doing that now, and that would work quite nicely. Whether they get permission to do it, I don't I don't know. But I thought that answer was very interesting. I think some, some fans may sort of run, jump off a cliff and overreact to it a little bit. <laughs> Maybe. that they may not be covering it in the same way that we potentially hoped and I can understand it to a point. We also don't know what they plan to do with it and I think we need to let that play out a little bit in terms of what they're looking at to, to sort of push that forward. My yeah. view is it's the here and now. And the, the wording, like I say, the, the contrast between the, the words main story and side story, maybe it was only ever going to be a side story anyway. It kind of is just a side mm. story in the grand scheme of things. The shooing and zimming narrative though. Um, maybe what he's saying there is they haven't got enough time. It, you know, it would take more Shenmue games to to really integrate that as a main story element. So it could just be a side story element, and you know, doesn't take the center stage perhaps like it would have done back in the day. But it's still going to be yeah. something that exists. Yeah, and I could I could see that actually. That makes a lot a lot of sense. That they just don't, if they obviously had an unlimited budget and massive amount of games, then they could probably give it more and more focus and attention. But I think you're right. I think it will be a part of something, but not detract away from the main story. Mm. Right. That brings us to the end of Shenmue Three. Now we're into again quite a meaty section here. This is what everybody is here for. There will be timestamp <laughs> for this. Don't True. you worry. Shenmue Four. Here we go. Shenmue 4. Right. It's being revealed and released right now. No. Um, <laughs> I wish. I wish. Question is, Shenmue fans would love to see a new entry in the Shenmue series. Could you tell us anything regarding work or plans for Shenmue 4? Right, so here's your answer, guys. So, we're not working on it right now. It's still in the planning stage. So then you ask, you sort of follow this up, what yep. would it take to get a Shenmue 4? Yusuzuki says a partner. And then we've got here, I'll, I'll stop at this point here because the other bit comes on to some story things. Have people expressed interest? He says, well, yes, there has been interest shown by a lot of people, which is interesting as well, that they, they, they've got a lot of interest shown, um, but obviously something hasn't really stuck thus far. I mean, yes. if you think back to those rumours about 110 Industries, maybe that could have been something that was one of these interested partners mm, but then it didn't true. go anywhere you know maybe you've had some sort of interest from it in in games perhaps that you know perhaps their their budget isn't as high as what you Suzuki wants for Shenmue games or that's like some interest shown I'm, I'm just these these are just ideas that I was just thinking about like all the different companies mm. that we know have sort of been attached to to the Shenmue name 
mm. in recent years, but never gone anywhere from it. You know, you've got your, your limited run games with Josh, who said that he would, if Shemu 4 gets made, he would fund a Shemu 5. You never know, maybe that's another interest there that maybe Josh has been interested in, like, he's, he's seen that there's not been much movement, so he's interested in Shemu 4, and, you know, may, maybe something like this has happened. I, 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 I don't know, guys. I'm just sort of thinking of the people that we know that we've heard from that yeah. may be potentially one of these partners that have been interested but obviously something stuck, something hasn't actually amounted from that. Um, so it'd be interesting to see you guys' thoughts on this this section of, this, well, this line of question. Where do we think yeah. Shemu4 is? I mean, in the planning stages, or is it further along than that? I mean, they must have something to have been pitched back in the day. Yeah. Agreed, so agreed. I think it's it, it's got to be, unless that still is the planning stages, but I've for me, it feels like it's a it's further along than the planning stage in a sense. Like they, they must have created something. Um, yeah. But again, that that could just be part of the planning stage. I don't really know how a video game creation works like that. With a pitch, I think you do something like a vertical slice of what you want to do with an overall game. So, and we know that exists. That's confirmed years ago by Cedric. And whether they've developed that pitch video or whatever it was i don't know it was confirmed some bits were playable in that as well so whether they've developed some of that as part of the planning stage i i i, I really don't know um the fact that it's still in planning is interesting because it means they're still actively thinking about it and i'm going to make yeah. the point here that i know the headline is show me four not in development and there will be sections that just pin on that mm -hmm. and i get why because we want Shenmue 4 to be in development. Everybody who watches, listens to all the dojo content, all the Shenmue community content, wants Shenmue 4 to be in development. This is confirming that it's not. and and But I don't think we should be surprised by that, personally, because there's not really been any sort of indications of anything anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not really a shock. I think the smart money would have been on that anyway. It's nothing new. Um and I wouldn't twist it into anything else than it's not in development. It's not they don't want to do it or anything like that. It's very, very clear that they need a partner to work with. And the interest bit is the bit that I really want to pick up on here as a point. If there's been interest in it, that's fantastic. That's great because it means that somewhere somebody sees something in Shenmue from a business standpoint that they can make this game work, they can make it happen. My question is, is that business standpoint enough in terms of the creative outlet that Yu Suzuki wants to tell the story of Shenmue 4 or 5? Do compromises need to be made to get that in the middle somewhere that then we can physically get this thing done? I, well, James, you and I have talked about episodic for as long as we can, and I still stand by that it's a really good way of doing it. I know people, it was very controversial, that video I did. Um, a lot of people got quite emotional about that. Um, but there has to be a way. If there's interest in the thing, that means people see a viability in it from a marketing standpoint, from a business standpoint, to some degree. Is that point enough for you to do what he wants? But on the flip side, does he need to make some potential compromises to allow it to happen? And the other question I have is actually, he's the creator, he can choose what he wants to do. Yeah. And that's, I think, for such a fan-driven IP can be quite difficult for fans, including myself, to almost take because we had a very big part in reviving the franchise, along with Yu Suzuki, along with everybody else who was involved with it. And I don't want to downplay any of it. But... At the end of the day, it's his creation. So he has the right as a creator to choose how he wants to do this thing. I just wonder whether he is... I don't want to sound really critical here because I don't want to. Whether he's refusing to digress from his own vision because that's what he really wants to do because he thinks that's the best thing for the series. And it's not marrying up to what's there in terms of a marketing, business, uh, proviso standpoint, if, if you know where I'm going with it. And I don't want to sound critical, but it's a fair question. Yeah, I completely agree, Matt. I mean, there's some sort of element of beauty in the fact that he's very much, he wants to make sure whatever happens 
it's the right you know the right thing by the series so maybe he has had some offers that quite aren't quite up to where he he sees a Shemu 4 um he, he wants to make sure that he produces the best game that he can and it is difficult i mean i'll point out that and a little bit later in the in the interview we we do you know if you've not read this interview yet, guys there is some interesting things regarding uh you know the wisenet and the, the the company at the mm -hmm. moment they are busy they've, they've mentioned this previously in in the early stages of the interview they're busy working on things and when you actually see what yu suzuki you know he, he's got all these ideas that we'll get into at some point of projects that he's He's thinking about making, so you don't know how these deals are being made. You know, we, you know, he had a an Apple deal for Air Twister, for example. We don't know if that factors in, you know, multiple games that they're, they're currently working on because they they're fulfilling a, a business deal that's taken place since Shimu Three, mm. with the mindset that these games are going to recruit re recoup uh, enough budget and and facilitate perhaps them then turning their attention to a Shemu 4 because of the success from these Apple Arcade games or if they they've got another partnership with another game that they're working on i mean for them to say that the the they're very busy that they haven't even got time in a sense to acknowledge the 25th anniversary of Shemu and do something because they're so busy and they they're working on a lot that is quite promising to me um to, to, to sort of hear that because at least they've got work at least the company's still there i mean we've been there in person that the the company's there you know these these staff in there working at computer monitors while we were in there so something must be ticking over for them to be able to continue producing games and for them to even say that they're busy is promising to me so mm. Quite. It's difficult because we are Shemu fans. We want more Shemu things in the world. But then, if you take the Shemu aspect out of there, at the end of the day, it's a video game creating company. It's Yu Suzuki, who's also famous for Outrun, Hang On, Space Area, yeah. yeah. Virtual Fighter. He's got all these ideas, and he's kind of hampered with, and this is not a negative that you know he's he's sort of stuck with all these people shouting for Shemu all the time, and maybe he wants to do other things. You don't know, maybe they were burnt out a little bit by the creation of Shenmue 3 and they want a break. I'm, I know from personal experience, Shenmue World Issue 2 sort of burnt me out a little bit because there was a lot to that and then the packaging and all that sort of stuff. It, it took the fun out of it at the time, even though I'm, I'm back into the swing of things with Issue 3. But you can see that for four years working on one project and still wanting more time and then it was cut short and maybe there's a bit of like a, a disappointment feeling to that and then the, the reviews that Shenmue 3 got... I know even even Shemu fans were disappointed with it, so some some sort of there could be, you know, damaging implications to that as, you know, people have feelings, right? So if they see that their game series that they created, a Shemu three, hasn't done as well as they expected it to or, you know, they wanted it to, even though it's a fantastic game, just that the negativity outweighs the positivity, you know what I mean? When you, you you release a YouTube video, Matt, and some someone will leave a, a negative comment. That stands out more than all the positive stuff. So, there, there could be a lot of factors into why Shemu Four is still in the planning stage. The positive is that the company is still very busy, and when you get to the end of the interview, that we're going to get to at some point, guys. So, if you hang on, <laughs> it seems very much that Shemu Four is something that they really, really want to do. And whether that just takes a partnership that could happen overnight. You know, we could be sat yeah. here since this interview. Someone could have expressed interest that actually it does work for whatever they want to produce. You don't know how these deals happen. These these deals just happen. Maybe the fact that this interview is out there in the ether and someone's listening to us right now or has read this interview and realizes that to get a Shemu 4, oh, I didn't realize that Yu Suzuki wasn't working on it. I'm a partner. I'd love to, you know, like a... A big company like Sony, or well, I, I'm pretty sure Sony <laughs> must yeah, know, must know I the know, ins and outs, but know you know what you're, I'm saying. I know where you're going. This I could trigger going. a partnership in itself because it's it's been stated here that what would it take to get Shemu for a partner? You know what I mean? So it, it would be nice, and I don't think that people should be disappointed by this. Um, 
I, I don't really see this interview having, say, a clickbait headline that says like Shenmue 4 isn't in development, because like you say, Matt, it's it's kind of a given that it's not. We've not really had any inkling of it since Shenmue 3. Uh, there's been drips and drabs of like rumors and stuff, but they never really got anywhere. Mm. And we've seen that Yu Suzuki's been working on other projects. You know, he announced with Ezra that they're working on a new game. Um, so I just think that people perhaps, I know it's been five years, that, that's, the, that's the issue we've got as well. Like it's, this is a story-based game and everyone that plays it wants to know what happens next. And we're all getting older and older and older and we're not closer to, to finding out what happens next. So I do get, and I'm disappointed in, in a sense as well that they're not working on a show before, but then are our expectations maybe too high as well? Um, like I say, I don't know. <laughs> what, what do you think, Matt? It's tricky because I think the, the bullet point headline, and you know someone will run with it, and go Shenmue 4 is not in development, it's over, blah, blah, blah. You you know that. You know what gaming media is like these days. It's all very negative. It's all very much clickbaity stuff. Yeah. And actually, when you read the interview, you go through the rest of it, it's not that... It's a given. We know that. But actually, what they're thinking about, what they want to do, they're clearly thinking about it. They're clearly trying to find a way for this thing to happen, mm-hmm. which makes it so so important that people need to be vocal about this thing and i've been saying this for years now a you need to get over shenmue 3 because it ain't going to change people so get behind shenmue 4 yeah um and we need to be on social media harassing sega people and making it known that we want that fourth game so you can show a prospective partner that a the fan base is united and b there's enough money in this thing that we can get that continuation and we can nudge it over the line because <laughs> somebody out there if there's interest in it clearly wants to make it happen it needs to make business sense there needs to be a way that it makes sense for everybody that everybody's happy that they make money you get the creative vision that we want and that things progress forward and i am obviously disappointed but yeah it's not it's not a shock it's just not a shock it's not a shock and and the fact that they're willing to sit down for an hour and 20 minutes to two hours with Shenmue fans discussing Shenmue and still be hesitant to reveal plotline spoilers, it just shows that they still intend to continue the series at some point. It's, <laughs> you know. And it's, and he said this a thousand times. If there is no other way, then the novel will come out. Mm-hmm. But all the time that that doesn't happen, there is a way. Now, I appreciate Yu Suzuki's getting older. He's in his 60s now. But why isn't it still open? It's making money. They're making games. They, they, they've got things on, which, as you say, is great. So all the time, why isn't it there? Great. That, that, that opportunity can happen. It's then, as I said, just nudging it over the line in the, in the right way that satisfies everybody. And I think the commu- what the community needs to do with this is, is take this as a, almost a bit of a wake-up call. Yeah. Like if you want to show me four people, we, just, we do need to get, shout still. Get off your asses and start shouting. Because if we don't start shouting, it, 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 it really won't happen. They want to do we it. We need to show these potential partners that there's enough of a fan base for them to think, All right, yeah, okay, let's give it a go, you know? Yeah. So. And that's, that's the tricky bit. And when you, t- you tag on the economy, tag on what's happening in gaming and all the layoffs at the moment it's tricky because some companies won't want to throw money at something like a Shenmue game but I could put that I could flip that and go well actually the whole AAA thing isn't sustainable so there's a big market of people that as potentially game production scales back to be more affordable quicker that these double A sort of titles find a niche find a home and Shenmue can very much do that it really mm-hmm. can um, but the clickbait will go, Shenmue 4 is not in development. Which is a shame because there's so much in this interview uh, and, and like you say, people are just going to hone in on the fact that they haven't got any Shenmue 4 news, which, you know, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't get you any Shenmue 4 news. <laughs> and I don't think he's going to reveal Shenmue 4 in an interview with Shenmue Dojo, quite no, frankly. probably as much not. As I'd like that. As, as, as much as I'd like him to do that. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. But what we need to be aware of here is actually they have had interest. Big, big positive, massive positive. If they were go, if they turned around to us right now and said, "Not really much interest," 
um, yeah, we're not quite sure to do it, we would be royally screwed. But yeah. there's been interest in it. So that's that's a positive. So we need to take advantage of that and, and nudge that interest from an interest to an actual commitment. We can do that and make enough noise through the social media, through the content, through everything else the community does. I believe it can happen. And I know we've talked about some wild things that we've got planned once we can get get through a few bits and pieces. I'm going to move away because we've sort of gone on a soapbox a little, a little bit about this. Um, we're going. In, we're now going to go into some of the story around Shenmue, Shenmue 4 and what we might get coming forward. Yep. So in terms of the story, um, you say, do you see Rio's journey ending in China or another country? Yeah, interesting question. I mean, if you look on the map, the chapter tiles map, the end of the game is like just in a Mon Mongolia somewhere, isn't it? Like towards there, they're mm -hmm. supposed to be in a Mongolia. We've seen screenshots of like Shen Fa, well, not screenshot, but Shen Fa in like a Tibetan outfit and that sort of stuff. So I, I thought this question was an interesting one because um, of the, the follow up question as well, but we'll get into is like what uh, part, part of the train of thought here. But Yu Suzuki laughs and says Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> Again, showing his sort of relaxed nature there, crack at a joke. But then he, he confirms that, yeah, Rio's journey is going to end in China. And then you follow up and say, there's no chance we'll see him go back to Japan. And he says, not currently. So, yeah. that, that's, so that's what I meant. Like... Fed that one a little bit, doesn't it? Because that's been around the community for years that he might go back to Japan. I know people want him to go back to Dubuit to go back to the dojo. Yeah. Not going to happen by the sounds of it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I was getting at with that, that series yeah. of questions. I just thought. I'd ask it in this way, just in case we got a peculiar answer before asking the Japan side of things, which is kind of like what the, the, the main point of the question was, I thought. And then we come on to some really interesting stuff here around the, the Chi Men, the four leaders. So you asked a question that we've heard in previous interviews that the Chi Men organization has four leaders with a single boss known as Tante above them. Have there been any changes to this structure? And then this is where we got some really, really interesting uh you know, news really, because this mm. has never been mentioned before. But Yusuke actually says that there's actually there's one more person. He says so. Not only we've we got the four leaders and then the Tentai guy, big boss above them, there's another person. Which is again news to me. Yeah. So we we sort of we were a bit shocked by that. We said, oh, what really An another boss? And then he started drawing on these you know these pieces of paper that I was saying that he, he was constantly sort of making notes and sort of. Um, showing us for, for extra little context what he was on about here hard to see in the photograph again like i didn't want to just say can we take a photo of this so here you can kind of see it from one of the other photographs that we sort of took around the sort of time of uh, yu suzuki but i've zoomed in there i've sort of changed the contrast of the the colors there a bit so you can sort of see the outline that he actually drew on the piece of paper here so what he actually does was he sketches a tree diagram onto a piece of paper showing a single circle at the top level with the four circles below. So the top level there is Tentai and the four uh, circles below all the four bosses that we already know about. So he says, indicating the top circle, this is Tentai, the big boss, indicating the four circles, these are Landi, Yawson, and so on. And then he draws an extra horizontal branch between the two levels with an ad additional circle. And then he says, "This is there's, there's one more person here, the chief of staff, which I forget what it was called in Japanese, but... Um, it was something like show show you or something. Um, I'll, I'll try and look that up at the same time. Yeah. So he kept he kept saying that he kept saying that word in Japanese a few times, which is interesting. Yeah, chief of staff. And that is just if you're looking at the image there, that's sort of where the pencils sit in that sixth boss that he was talking about there. Which is very very interesting. So the Yuleng asks, they male or female? He says male. And highly knowledgeable, like an expert strategist and advisor. Mm. Now that's interesting that there's a strategist involved because that's the first, again the first we've ever heard of something like this. Yeah. So when I heard that word, this is me with the the follow up question here. I was thinking, you know, I was on about Baisha being like a sort of a three kingdoms or um, mm. you know warring kingdoms sort of vibe. I was thinking maybe that's what he's thinking of with the, with the term strategist because I know that's kind of like all these guys on horses and there's like a big strategy to the, the sort of the the, the the raid whatever whatever's going on there so i said perhaps like a strategist from china's three kingdoms period so yusuke he sort of just makes like an, an agreeing hmm um 
We don't know whether or not he was a green, or perhaps he was thinking maybe um, he's not a green. It's uh, kind of left to the listener to decide there, or the reader in this case. Yeah, sort of mulling it over almost. Yeah. And then the next question, so it's a follow-up to that, will you ask, will they make an appearance in Shenmue 4? He says you probably won't appear until Shemu 5, but maybe at the end of Shemu 4. So does that mean that you reckon the other bosses are going to make an appearance in Shemu 4 then? If there's a chance that the sixth... Yeah, well, if the sixth boss has a chance of appearing at the end of Shemu 4, but he probably won't appear until 5, we're going to have to get some more bosses in Shemu 4. We're going to have to, aren't we? It's absolute insanity. Um, we don't otherwise, which... Again, we sort of cover some of this a bit later in the later question, but... Uh, the, the fact that there is like a level between the, the four, then you've got Tente, and then you've got this chief of staff sort of sitting between them. It begs the question, did Niao Sanon oh, act yes. on orders from them? Yeah, well, I'm, I was thinking, and it, I was also thinking that, that this at the time, and I kind of wish I, I just outright asked at the time, but I was thinking... Because I was kind of thinking differently. I, I was going on that sort of uh, Warring Kingdoms train of thought. But then afterwards, I was thinking, the way it sounds like this strategist, this, this guy that's not a leader, maybe it is just simming, I was thinking. But I was hesitant to ask because of also that earlier question where he was like, that wouldn't make the main story. It might be a side story with simming and chewing. Yeah, but when yeah, you yeah. think about it, if you look at that side story comic, Niao Son... Zimming sort of, and it's been spoken about in the the Shemu Master interviews that he isn't one of the four leaders. So, but Zimming does feel like a big boss. So maybe he is the sixth boss that's sort of just creating these st strategies and plans, potentially for in the house on. Um, maybe I'm not sure. Maybe. That that's something that came into my head, and I, I kind of wish I just outright asked, you know, could that, is that guy Zimming? Just to sort of see if we could sort of tell at least a reaction from you, Suzuki. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't. Never mind. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, though, it's still quite an interesting point. Very, that, very, very. Uh, there's another layer to this thing that we, we didn't really know. And then the sort of final question on this, um, you then ask that we know of the two mirrors in the game, but do any more mirrors exist? Is there a relationship between the number of mirrors and the number of chi men either? Yeah, just another sort of question from my own sort of brain here that I just wanted a bit of confirmation on, really. If there's going to be two more mirrors, one for each boss. Obviously, we've got the, the concept art of like what looks to be a tiger mirror-shaped design that was, um, you know, from back in the day. But Yu Suzuki says that, no, there's no connection. So to me, that sort of confirms that there's only going to be two mirrors. There's, ever, always, yeah. there's, <laughs> there's only ever going to be two mirrors. Yeah, and I yeah, I think that's that's rock solid confirmation of that at this yep. point in time. So then we come on to future Shenmue games. Now again, this 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 opening question I think is probably a discussion point in itself. Yeah. Um, but it's one that I think we're all keen to to have asked, and this answer has been asked many many times. I think the answers have changed a little bit over the years, give or take. But you outright ask, what would your preference be for the number of games to complete the series? And there's a nice mm. picture here, actually. There's a nice you, picture. It's it might not be that <laughs> it might not be me asking this particular question because you've got the sort of a Yu Suzuki death stare there at me. But um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is his answer anyway. He says, I think it would probably be best for the players also to reach the ending in two more games. So again, he's, he's still sort of sticking to that two game mindset. And he says, and for those people that want to know everything about the story after completing the series, perhaps a novel or similar could be released. Which is a great thing to hear. I love that. Yeah, that's interesting that he's then gone, I still, I don't want to release a novel until the games have been done. And yeah. that again reconfirms that. But also when things have been finished, that he's willing to release the novel. Because mm -hmm. actually that's, that's going to give us what was in it, what wasn't in it what we'd like to see if they remade things there'd be a million and one thing I could, we'd go mad over something like that in comparison yeah, to the games it'd be exactly. great content for years wouldn't it and it also kind of means that they kind of don't have to fulfill every single little element that we've built up in our brains in the future Shemu titles because hopefully that would be in the, no the novel version to give us a bit of peace of mind but the games could focus elsewhere kind of a thing um, mm. it sort of gives them a little bit more leeway then to perhaps not try and completely cram everything in two more games if 
some of the answers could be left for the novel for the the sort of the the law drooling fans <laughs> which would be good and and actually it might also factor in if the anime does get a second season mm. they can use some of that novel aspect in that mm-hmm. side of things which gives it that side of it its own identity away from the games which the first scenes of the anime did really really well and i think i mean more show me content the better really yeah. but that would be we'll see how it goes but I, I like the fact that they are willing to release a novel once this is done and sort of following on from that you ask uh, how do you foresee a possible development time frame for the next games in the series and this answer is very interesting this is a good answer so he says if the two more games then it's say five years each it would take 10 years even if Shemu 4 and 5 were done together over six years. So, yeah, that's an interesting point as well. So he, he's, he's sort of got that in his head. That That's good. Again, that's goes back to the Shemu 4 sort of disappointment that we're hearing. But then now he's sort of saying that he's, he's kind of got an idea in his head that if it took him five years for each of those games, it would take 10 years. So in theory, based off of this answer... We could have a Shemu 4 and a 5 by the year 2034. <laughs> but then he's, he's also saying, but there's, I, I, I guess maybe he's, he's thinking if, a, if the right partner comes on board and we can do a 4 and a 5 at the same time, sort of like what they did with a Shemu 1 and 2, then it would only take mm. six years. Um, so that's that's pretty a cool answer to hear, I think, that he's, he, he, he kind of understands in his head actually now how long it might take for the series to get done because if you think previously he was saying i think it was one of the gdc talks or something where he was saying it even if they did each chapter every year it would take 10 years and then it's been 10 years since he said that and we're kind of like only a chapter on or two chapters on from that mm. so if he'd have done a chapter a year we'd have been finished by now essentially whereas we're still quite a long way from it so he's kind of now saying five years a chapter in a sense isn't he, or five years a game so he, he, um, he seems to be a, a little bit more, um, what's the word, like, he, he sort of understands the time frame it would take now mm. to, to get this done. Yeah, and I wonder if this answer leans in a little bit to what you alluded to around the partner, mm-hmm. that he is potentially seeking a partner for two games rather than one. That's a good which point. Which is a big, big yeah. commitment in itself, which could be a stumbling block for a partner because they may go, well... We want to see how Shenmue 4 does before we commit to a Shenmue 5. And there were rumours flying around with, with Shenmue 3 that if that did well, would Deep Silver have come back for Shenmue 4 mm. and all that sort of thing. So it does beg the question that I think he wants to do two more games. Yeah. And I'm, I'm reading between the lines. I have no evidence of this whatsoever. I wonder if that's a stumbling block for potential partners, potentially. It could be, but then in, in the same same breath, it's... It's a good angle to sort of sell the project on because he's kind of saying that it's going to take two more games to finish the series. So if he's then suggesting that the fifth game is going to be the last game, then is that a good angle for a partner to come on board? So they're not just facilitating this game that isn't going to, still not going to finish the series and going to get a lot of fans annoyed or whatever again, or a lot of randomers that have been following the story and they were annoyed that Shemu 3 didn't finish it and then you got Shemu 4 and you're sort of pushing the boat but if you can package them as a, a deal for a certain partner that you can make these last two games and get the series finished that to me seems like a good angle like if he if he's he's holding out a few extra years to get the right partner that can make two games in a sense or give them a deal that confirms they can make two more games, then he won't be stuck in this sort of endless void that he's stuck in now at the end of Shenmue 3, where they had the the funding for one game, and now they're kind of stuck because they still need two more games. So he sort of learnt from the mistake of, instead of asking a partner to just do one game, if I ask him to do two games, we can get this thing wrapped up. <laughs> yeah, I see your point. I just, is it viable? It's it's it it's viable? a tough 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 ask for sure. Yeah, that's that's the, the question. I think we're all probably asking in, in in the community. I know it's been discussed in our Discord for on and off for, for a few years now. Is is whether they can make it viable? If they can, 
I want both games. I really, really do. Yeah. Because I think that would be the proper vision. We get the story we want and everybody's happy as Larry, hopefully. I am yet to see evidence that it's viable, but I'm happy to be told I'm wrong. And yeah, I well, really do want to be told I'm wrong because I'd love to see a four and a five. I would, I would, man. And and this next little section of... Um because he's still sort of on the same yeah. answer here. This is really interesting. So he actually gets a piece of paper out again, starts sketching. He um, he sketches a line marked out with the chapter. So sort of like that blackboard, uh, not blackboard, but whiteboard rather. Oh, yeah, yeah, Image yeah. of like the 1 to 16. This is kind of what he did on a sheet of paper, which was quite interesting, but 1 to 11. And then he sort of starts shading in parts of the chapters that have been completed. So he says, if the novel is this long, so he's, he's sort of saying it's like 11 chapters, so far, this much of it has been put in the game, so he shades approximately a third of this 1 to 11 line. He's, he's trying to say that a third of this line so far has been completed. That's what we got so far yeah. with 1, 2, and 3. Then, for example, these parts could then go into a 4 and a 5, shaving, uh, shading further areas of this line, and then these into four, um, 6 and 7, even, which is crazy for him to even say that. Or, yeah. alternatively, alternatively, at the end of five, so so he's basically saying that he, he could potentially squeeze. So if he if, if he had it that his, his own way, a third of the game's been done, the next two games would be a third, and then the two games after that would be a third. But then he's saying all, alternatively, both two thirds in the next two games and end it at five kind of thing. And then he says, but then if locations like your Baishas, your Li Wang were to be included too, then you know the end may never be re reached so <laughs> which is uh, you know, quite right it is quite what crap quite right that you know he's got all these ideas all these chapters all these locations and stuff if he was to include absolutely everything you know we, we might ne never get there so he's he then says it could be shrunk by telling some of the story for example in dreams or his flashbacks include everything in two more games include everything in four games i don't think trying to squeeze it all into just one more game is a good idea though so it seems like he's dead set on at least two more games and that's interesting that he said that because i know he's previously commented saying he could probably finish it in a fourth game but it sounds like that he doesn't want to for, for mm -hmm. i'm guessing creative reasons which that is his prerogative as the creator of the shenmue series um I do like that he's thinking about shrinking or, or telling some of the story in an alternative way within the game, like dreams or flashbacks. I know he talked about playable flashbacks with Ezra in that interview uh, last year. Yeah. So that fits into that side of things. Um, mm -hmm. It comes. I like the idea of four and five. I like what he's thinking. It's whether we. Can, I just whether it's viable to do it is is the big question here. But I. Would, I want that full vision. I really, really do. And it excites me that he's got ideas of how he can get the story in, as much of the story in as he can, shrink things down to make it work so that can potentially be done. Um, whether we see that is, is another question, but this is why we need to make as much noise as we should do. Yeah, well, the, the problem... Sorry, man, I was, I was just going to say, the, the problem you've got is you don't know how much of the rest of the story is. In his head, he knows he's got all these ideas, all these story things that he wants us to see and, and witness and stuff. And, you know, the, the, he's obviously, when he's only shading the third of the line, and that's where we're at with Shemu 3, it might seem me mental that he's still got two thirds of this line left to tell. But in his head, he's got this story. You know, they've worked on it. They've got a novel. These things he wants to add in there. So someone sort of pressuring him to to sort of cut half of that and just make one more game to conclude the story as a creator as someone that's that's has the story in his head it must be so difficult to sort of come to terms with designing a way to just end something that you've put so much time and mm -hmm. and thought into just to get the story ended so i, I do admire that he wants to at least tell enough and find ways like you just said like flashbacks and stuff of trying to squeeze these elements of the story that he really wants us to, to, to see otherwise he probably would just create another game he probably would have just ended it with Shenmue 3 but because he wants to make sure that he, he, he gives 
Shamu enough love. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I admire that in a sense, even though it's probably unrealistic. Um, I, I, I just really appreciate that he cares so much about his creation there that you know he's he's not happy to just shove it all into one game. Yeah, it's brave. It's mm. definitely brave. Yeah. I'll give him give him that. We move in then to Shenmue Zero. It's a, a small section of the interview, but one that's equally imp as important. I think we will sort of do these together. Yeah. So in a recent interview with IGN Japan, you mentioned the idea of Shenmue Zero. We'd love to hear more about this concept if you have anything to share. He just says, well, it's only at the level of an idea at the moment, so it doesn't seem like anything's happened since that IGN Japan. He just no. something you thought about. You follow up to say if it were to be made, would it take place before the events of Shenmue 1? He says yes. Yes. Straightforward there. Mm -hmm. Would it follow a wow as a young man? He says no, it wouldn't, which is interesting. And then you ask, would it be probably focused on Rio? And he nodded. Yeah. That's kind of where we got there. It, it just felt like he didn't really have much to say regarding Shamu Zero. Mm -hmm. So we just thought, oh, well, we'll just move into a different subject now. Um, obviously, I, he's yeah. kind of just ended there, if you know what I mean. I think the Shamu community would. <clears throat> Be openly in disagreement that it will follow Rio. A lot of people are clamouring if they did a Shimmy Zero for it to follow a WoW, and mm -hmm. I'm in that ballpark as well. But I'm, yeah, I'll I'll leave that there. I've done a video on it if you want to check that out instead, rather than listen to me babble on about it here. So then we come on to Shenmue the animation again. It's quite a short part of the interview, but equally important. And you say that the fans really enjoyed the anime, and we definitely did. It was unfortunate to hear that the second season will not be going ahead following the Warner Brother Discovery merger in April 2022. Is there still any possibility of a second season? Yeah, so this this response here is, is quite interesting, and, and potentially the reason why we cut the Shenmue, the animation section of the interview short. I mean, we were looking at the clock at this point, trying to make sure that we got enough time to, to say all the other the questions that we had, but his answer here sort of led us to think like it's probably not worth talking too much about a second season now because his answer is actually it's my understanding that only season one had been planned for the anime season one was based on Shimmy one and two and developed in conjunction with sega although i also supervised for season two since the rights to Shimmy three are held by wisenet our involvement would be needed in the end though the decision for a second season is up to sega as they own the original ip Shemu IP, and we would of course be happy to cooperate if approached regarding it. So yeah, quite an interesting answer because as far as Yu Suzuki's concerned, he only ever thought that the anime was going to be a season one. Um, we obviously know different yeah. in that Jason DeMarco was planning for season two. He looked like he'd gone into almost pre-planning for pre-production before it got canned. It's also interesting, and this again a tidbit of information we didn't know about, that the rights to Shenmue 3 are held by WiseNet. I thought they'd have been held jointly between WiseNet and Deep Silver, but it doesn't seem that way here. Yeah, it seems like to... I mean, obviously they're going to say yes, but to use any Shenmue 3 element in, you know, a Season 2 or a Shenmue 0 or if Sega decided to do, like, something else that included some element of Shenmue 3, then WiseNet would need to be... Um, I don't know, like the, the that part of Shenmue would need to be licensed from WiseNet, I guess, mm. if they own the rights. Which, yeah, it was quite interesting to hear. That's interesting. What happens if WiseNet shut down? What happens to Shenmue 3's IP then? I mean, yeah, I, it's a good question, but I mean, would it go back to the original Maybe. owner, in a Maybe. sense, like Sega? Even though WiseNet That's... created it, it's still a Sega IP, isn't it? So... Yeah, I guess I guess so. Mm. I guess so. That'd be interesting. And then there's a follow-up question here. It says, I see it would it be a similar case regarding the creation of further Shemu games, such as a Shemu Zero. And he says, yes, that's right. Yeah. So that, that's interesting to hear that any future Shemu game, like a Shemu Zero or whatever, um, is up to Sega, which I suppose is a given, yeah. but... Um, I don't know. I don't know if that was like that. completely yeah, out there publicly, that knowledge. There we go. That then moves us off of the sort of Shemmy talk and into WiseNet other projects. Yeah. And we start off with, with Air Twister. Uh, and you, you ask a straight question how did you find the re reception to Air Twister? He says, I think it was received very positively overall. 
especially people who have played Space Harry before and found it nostalgic. For younger players, it might have been good to include a continue feature. I can understand that. Yeah, yeah I get the point. Mm -hmm. Patch it in. Um, <laughs> Next question, uh, was there any difference in the feedback from the players in the West versus Japan? Now, this was interesting. Yeah, so he actually says that the reception from Western audiences was even better than in Japan, which, um, yeah, interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I'm quite a little bit surprised. I don't I don't know. Maybe Do you think that's me, a, but... like a Shenmue fan mindset? Because obviously we are kind of the, the big Shenmue cult following, aren't we, over in the West, that perhaps that sort of fed into wanting to support yeah. a future WiseNet project more so than... Um, Japan who may have sort of tailed off from whatever Yu Suzuki's creating today <laughs> or at least at least yeah. that audience isn't as big as like ours that, that Shemu fan mm. the western Shemu fan I think retro and things like that I don't know if they're as big in Japan as they are in True. the west maybe that's a factor I'm, I'm not saying that from any position of knowledge it's just <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about as, as we as we go yeah. uh, next question you ask is given its success would you consider creating a sequel to Air Twister Interestingly, he said yes, if there's a call for one. So again, another one that we're going to have to do on the Air Twister day of the month, whatever month we give that to. Uh, let's get Air Twister 2. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. Uh, you asked the next question, could you tell us about any other projects or games you're working on or have planned? So he says, there are a lot that I would like to make. As for the current project being worked on, I'm not able to talk about it as it's top secret. But following that, I have about five or six concepts from small to large projects. Currently, I'm looking for a partner. So again, that that, that partner word again, it, it seems like they're not struggling as a sense because they are creating a project currently, uh, and there's a chance that it could be announced this year, which we'll allude to in a moment. But they sort of need partners, and like, like the Air Twister thing was an Apple partnership, so that facilitated that. Uh, maybe this new project is another one by Apple, for, for all we know. Um, so yeah, get if you're a partner, <laughs> get out there and get your get, money out. Get get emailing you Suzuki, I suppose. <laughs> get your money out. And then the next, uh, it's interesting. Says top secret, so it obviously sounds like it's still being worked on, and yeah. it's alluded to in a bit. Uh, next question is: Is work being carried out on any of these concepts at the moment prior to a partner being found? Yeah, interesting. He says yes, we're experimenting. So they do kind of at least create parts of these concepts to, I guess show to these eventual partners that you know what the working makes, makes concept sense. is yeah for like pitching things or whatever it makes absolute sense they've got some sort of prototyping going on yep. and then you ask outright can we look forward to a game announcement at some point this year he says maybe yeah maybe well he so, says he says there may be a game that we can announce later this year so we just keep an eye out for that to see have to see on that on that side of things and it like we said earlier it's exciting they've got projects they're working on clearly they're working on a game at the moment so the lights are on the bills mm -hmm. are being paid and that's only a positive thing and hopefully any money they make will go towards a Shenmue 4. The next topic is interesting it's China travel so this is stretching back to some of the early concept stuff. Yeah so let me give you a quick background on this so we actually asked these questions. So so after the interview, like I say, it went on for an hour and 20 minutes. Um, so this this chunk of questioning now is actually something that came a little bit after the interview. So Yu Suzuki actually kindly took us to a nearby Chinese restaurant where we had some lunch. And still sort of in that interview mindset, I got a few little questions. But this was more of a casual, laid-back sort of um line of question now if you can sort of sense that we sort of laughing and joking and sort of just asking some interesting things that we thought about that we we, we wanted to ask you Suzuki that weren't necessarily part of the interview and um, just sort of some personal questions I thought if you know what I mean yeah yeah that's cool and it, some of the answers I think reflect that quite nicely so earlier you mentioned that Shuzo would be one of the locations in Shenmue 4 this is one of the locations you visited yourself in person back in the early 90s as part of your China research trip for Virtua Fighter, wasn't it? And he actually said that he'd been to Shuzo about three or four times. And most recently was around 10 years ago, I think. Yeah, so he's been, which would line up because I'm sure there were photos and things during Shemi 3's development. Wow. That is 10 years ago, isn't it? GDC. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Mm. Uh, next question: We see you 
Uh, seeing a photo of you outside of Tulu, it looks really big. Do families live inside? I love this. Yeah, me too, me too. So he was telling us, he kept going on about the, the donut shape of these buildings. Uh, very fond of this, this style of building. But he says that, yes, families live in a vertical section consisting of up to four stories. He says the bottom level is the kitchen, and above that are the bedrooms and living rooms and so on. But the stairs are public. So basically, which is crazy, because I'd never really thought about this, but if you think of like a, a four-story house that you'd have like a, a detached house, this is actually in a donut shape, and it's everyone living in this one building. And the only way to access your second story floor, your third story floor, is a public access stairs. So we asked the question, so what? So to go from the second to the third floor, for example, you have to go out of your house, up some outdoor steps, and then back in your house for the next floor up, and he said exactly, which is crazy to think. <laughs> Mad that you have to go out. So imagine if you want to go from your kitchen, you've got your dinner for your family. You go, yeah, I've made a really nice Let's go bed. Like, Pissing <laughs> down with rain. Yeah, let's or go bed. We've got to go up, up some public steps. <laughs> Random, isn't it? I do like the design of the buildings. Though. I it's do. Quite funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like this question actually. Do you still have the original itinerary from your early '90s China research trip? Yeah. So this is sort of something that's inspired because I was thinking, like, man, if he says yes, and it shows you all the locations that he, he went to, it's sort of a bucket list thing. I'd love to follow in his footsteps and visit these places that he actually did. But he said no, not anymore. For that trip, there were actually two research teams. One went to the mountain areas and the other on the plains. That's, that's interesting. And then you followed that up to ask what team he was a part of. Yeah, and he says he was part of the mountain one. Uh, he says, we went to the Shaolin Temple and Mount Song, which was interesting to hear, actually, because when I was doing that research stream, one of the things that was near to the Shaolin Temple when I was like, like researching the Shaolin Temple was the Mount Song. And this guy actually climbed up this mountain and it looked so cool. I was like, man, I reckon you Suzuki's done this mountain because with it being so close to there. So obviously he did, he, he, he went there. He says also Menkun, which is the birthplace of the martial art called Bajikwan, although the Shaolin Temple may be more well known. And then this, like I said, this is a bit more of a relaxed, relaxed line of um, just conversation, just having a little bit of a meal with him. He said, uh, when he saw Mount Song, he shouted, Oh, Susan! Or something like that. Because apparently in Japanese, Mount Song is called Suzan. Okay, yeah. Because like, Zan is like mountain, and obviously Su is like the Japanese word for song in this case, Suzan, um, which is pronounced the same as the female name Susan. So I was laughing. I was like, oh, you know, like the female name, because my mum's actually called Susan. And actually, my wife's mum's name is Susan, so we were all kind of laughing at that. <laughs> um, I guess, being English, Susan's quite a common name. Yeah. Uh, I, d I don't know where he had that from, you know, being Japanese and in China shouting Susan. <laughs> and then he, 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 yeah, he's laughing. He said, did you get it then? In, in China, my joke fell flat. And then you ask him, speaking of languages, can you speak any Chinese? And again, he, he did another little joke. He said, no. Nope. Ni hao. <laughs> um, but then he said, when I visited the mountains, I met with ethnic minority people there. Deep in the mountains, they speak their own dialogue, but not English or Mandarin. So we had to use multiple translators. And then he's sort of gest gesturing with his hands here. He said, I, I spoke. Then my words were translated. And then once more. So there was like a chain of three people. So I was like, you know, again, kind of just joking. So I was like, oh, well, like, like literally Chinese whispers. <laughs> And he said, if you tell a joke, it's really hard for it to get through because no one laughed, uh, which is interesting because it's tra translated um, three times. Uh, yeah, so it gets lost really a bit, doesn't lost it? Lost in translation, yeah. When that happens. And then you ask, was the village you visited in the mountains the basis for Bailey Village? So Yusuzuki came back and said, yes, it was a Miao village, but it was the model for Bailu. So, yeah, this was interesting because at first we did think he was on about the village that he visited being like based on that cut content from Shenmue 2 from Yao Village but he's I think in the translation we sort of gathered that in the end that he was obviously he was talking that the village that he visited was a Miao village kind of minority ethnic group and it was that village that sort of inspired Bailu um, so that's pretty cool to, to actually learn that and then you go on to ask have you visited Guilin yourself 
Yeah, I thought it was a good good time to ask that. He said, no, I hadn't. I'd like to go there one day and also to a place called Zhang Zhaiji. It's a place with natural rock formations which become a which became a national forest park in around 1982. And I included a little picture there for context, but it looks absolutely stunning, doesn't it? It looks Guilin all the way. It does it look like Guilin, yeah. In fact, it looks more like the Shemu Three Mountains. Are they a bit more jaggedy? It does a bit, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I could agree with that, actually. definitely does. And then, sort of, I think this is the final section, and... Thank you everybody for sticking with us. It's turned into a full mountain podcast, but that's it's never been a good though, actually. Yeah, it's been good going through this, and hopefully everybody gets all the little tidbits that we want out of it. We're talking about the Shenmue community now. It's probably quite an apt way to close this interview off, I think. Yeah. And the first question you sort of pose to him is: the Shenmue fan community continues to show immense support for Shenmue. Um, there have been lots of community projects and events, such as the recent fan meetup in. Debrief in January. There's a photo there of that. Um, you can see Switch there. Um, I think uh, Aaron's on the left, bottom left. Aaron. Uh, You've got, yeah. Um, Dimitri from the Guy Industries just above Switch yes, standing up. Making making that game with the supermarket. Yeah, the in Conveni. That looks really good. That's it. Yeah, that's really cool. And then there's a couple of other people actually in here that revealed themselves to be like um, worked on on the games as well back in the day, which was interesting. Can we harass them? Get the sand build. Hey, you never know. Well, you never know. And then coming down, you said this uh, This is also Shemma World Magazine with issue three coming soon. It will include a complete Chopra Chan hunt guide. Now, this is a reveal in itself. It is, yeah. I mean, obviously, I was revealing this to, to you, Suzuki, um, sort of showing that this is something that's actively being worked on. Because um, obviously, he got sent issue one and two, and he did that awesome little tweet of him actually unwrapping issue one that. I mean, that was a crazy moment in time for me. That 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 moment itself. So uh, I thought it'd be nice to show because this artwork, especially like the the front cover with the Bailu Village characters, and then um, obviously the the rear cover I showed as well, which I won't spoil. But mm. I, I I thought yeah, it would get yeah. a bit of a kick out of that. Uh, I've, I've he, seen the back cover and it looks. They both look amazing. Yeah, and he actually said Sugoi because that's like the Japanese word for awesome, which was pretty cool i'm sort of showing him something like this and uh he's actually uh, very interested in it yeah and that's the first peek you get of the cover so there we go it's actively being worked on people who keep asking it's coming it will be available soon hopefully uh moving on uh there's something fun from the community as well he show off the shenmue theme shenmue car. car yeah which he got a bit of a kick out of he laughed he said that's great oh a shenmue car I started pointing out like the little uh, motifs on it. And then quite aptly, you then go into a question about fan games released recently. You've got George Kitchen's op upcoming game, which didn't have a name at the time, but obviously it's now called Shemmy Reclaiming the Path. It uses yep. the graphic style matching the Dreamcast games. And he says, ah, it's set in Guilin. And he seemed quite impressed by it, by the sounds of it. Yeah, he, he did. Um, like I say, I was, I was just flicking through some screenshots I had on my phone. This was still over lunch this line of questioning and was just sort of showing him like these are all the things that are happening right now in case he, he hadn't seen them um, and yeah he you know, took a shine to this as well and then going further down this is another recent game which is like a Tamagotchi a Chobu-chan virtual pet and his answer to this is um, interesting because we say Chobu-chan is very popular with fans yeah he's like oh really like he was surprised by that there's a business opportunity there, right there, right yeah. there. Show the channel. channel on everything. Yeah. And then you ask, uh, do you follow uh, a lot of these community projects? And he says that we do check from time to time and he loves the great ideas, which is nice which to is hear. Cool that yeah. He is seeing these. And then we come on to the final message. Now, if you ever wanted to have a reason to get out there, start campaigning, start pushing, this message is a reason. Mm -hmm. um, so you ask him, does he have a final message for the fan community, James? So he says, thank you for everyone's continuing support. We are ready to create Shemu 4 as soon as the right conditions and opportunity present themselves. I hope to be able to make it happen. Please continue to invite friends and family and grow the great Shemu community as you have been doing. Thank you. Great, great words. So it just shows his commitment. To, to wanting to create the next title in the Shemu series, Shemu 4. He 
specifically points out Shenmue 4 there. And obviously under the right conditions, as we mentioned earlier, with the right partnership perhaps, there's uh, this something that he wants to happen and uh, hopefully it can happen sooner rather than later. Yeah, and th again, this sort of then feeds into um, my, my, my spear I'm going to do here that on the 4th of every month, hashtag let's get Shenmue 4, hashtag Shenmue Anime 2, get out on social media, X formerly known as Twitter, and make some bloody noise. <laughs> Come on, you know, it, the more we grow, the more noise we make, we'll get there. Outside of the 4th, make sure, <coughs> excuse me, you're engaging with the content that you're tweeting at people like Sega when they're tweeting things about random games, like putting Shadow in games. And I quite literally went out and said, <laughs> no, don't do that. Make Shenmue, you cowards. Yeah. And it got quite, that got quite a, quite a response to that. Stuff like that makes noise. Stuff like that puts pressure on. Stuff like that keeps Shenmue in the, in the limelight. Polls, all the rest of it. You keep Shenmue's name alive. You keep it in the mindset. You keep it in the forefront of people's minds. And you prove there is a demand for this fourth and fifth, potentially fifth game. And we will get there. But if we stop, if we go quiet, it's game over. And that is it. But I'll come away from that spiel now. James, I want to sort of put you on the spot. Some yep. final thought on this whole thing. I mean, it's a fantastic interview. It's, it's a lengthy interview. There's lots of tidbits of information in there the community to sort of get their get their teeth into how was it doing it would you do it again oh, Anything man. You <laughs> all the rest of it yeah for sure i'd do it again I, honestly it was one of the best days of my life um something that if anyone's followed the shimmer dojo probably since about 2018 you know you've sort of seen me and matt grow from very shy sort of characters at the first, you know, taking over the website from Peter Campbell. And, you know, we've sort of come leaps and bounds, I think, over the over the years. We've grown, I'd say, more confident. You know, you've got people like KC that invited him, invited us onto his podcast show that sort of got us a little bit more able to sort of have this sort of a public persona uh, where we can sort of share information like this publicly with even, you know, video footage, which... As a shy guy, I'd never thought I'd be sat here talking about this in front of an audience and being able to, to meet up with Yu Suzuki, um, physically be invited into the, the WiseNet's offices and sit down and have a face-to-face -face interview. That's something that I honestly, I, I was so such a shy child, honestly. And to, to, to be able to get to this point now is, is amazing. Um, it just sort of shows how far a person can can grow um you know i i never thought I'd, I'd i'd be in this sort of a position and you know i want to express my thank you to everyone who has supported the dojo um you know especially since me and matt have, have sort of t taken on this huge fan site that sort of like just devoured all of our time but um, <laughs> it's it's such a privilege to be able to be in this position, and um, I, I just I'm, I'm lost for words. Really, how it just feels so surreal that this this day happened. It was like an out of body experience, but one that I've got these photographs of, I've got this memory of. I'm able to express how it felt. It was just such a, a nice, relaxed atmosphere, and I just I, I I've to go from how I was as a person all those years ago and to this point in time now is just it's amazing and you know it also almost makes me a bit tearful really like how how far we've come Matt and you know yourself you've done so much amazing work over the years with these interviews you've had speaking to like people like Cedric and all these people that are, are, are massive names in the industry and you know it's it's, it's just a, a, it is a privilege and I do want to express my thanks as well to Switch who accompanied me again just as nervous as I was and he's actually already done an interview with you Suzuki so it was nice having someone like that there to sort of put my mind at ease that this guy's been through it and he's going to be sat next to me sort of battling together to, to, to try and get this interview done and I think together we've rattled through all these questions and I, I hope that the final product of this interview is actually something that you have, you guys have actually enjoyed learning about I know we haven't got that Shemu 4 confirmation that we want but we've got quite a lot of like little story tip bits and information here and there that has been at least on on my brain over the years that 
it's nice to finally get a bit more clarification from. So yeah, a massive thank you and shout out to Switch from Frontoriverstone.com for sort of being my partner in crime uh, during this actual interview. Um, such an amazing experience to to to. Uh, <laughs> it, it it was my plan, Matt, to sort of go into what we did after that as well because we we kind of made the most of this day as as you know quite a, a meaty Shamu day. So even after we finished having this conversation with Yu Suzuki and Joel. Um, after we left, you know, we wanted to sort of let it sink in what had just happened. So we actually went to Dubuita Street. And I mean, depending on how you're doing for time there, Matt, if you want to pull up some photographs, we can <laughs> rattle through them if you like, just to sort of give, give a little bit of a closure to this sort of interview and just give the uh, the listeners a bit of a sense of what this day actually was like. So let's let's start with the photos then. So photo number one. I mean, like you said some of these are repetition photos from the article, but still yeah, worth going through. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, photo, photo one, Yu Suzuki, part of the interview there. That was when he was number two, when he was shown as the book. Three is actually that same one from the article of um, Switch holding up things. But yeah. then four, Switch showing off the the books a little bit more, and then also image five, a little bit inside there. So if anyone wants to zoom in on that. See that. <laughs> see that yellow paper right translate that come yeah. on, let's do it uh five is me reading the questions that we've seen sorry six sorry seven actually yeah. hopefully you can't see my address on the box but um i think it should be probably a bit too blurry on the screen there but that was a gift i give to you suzuki so um it was pretty cool to see him actually opening that and uh he, he was quite happy with that pleased with that uh eight is just at the end of the interview really we just took a photo outside and i see um he looks really well there, I thought. Like, really nice. Yeah, happy he does. He looks, like, he looks happy and well and healthy. Yep. And then, like I say, after the interview, we, me and Switch headed off to your Costco. Um, which you can see there is like just as you come out the station, greeted by that Costco bird thing. Um, yeah. And then some Shamu esque things that I'm sure people that have actually been to Dubuita Street have seen. But you've got like the sort of the mountain. <coughs> is it? <laughs> And enslaved by um, these things, the sort of lot, uh, stop landslides, but it's very much what you'd, yeah, you'd yeah. see in the game. Uh, image 11, Nozomi's flower shop. Uh, 12, ah, very nice. Very much a Shemu esque scene, right, with the stairs. Yeah, definitely. 13, the playground area, possibly the inspiration for Sakuroka Park. Um, some more stairs sort of leading up to like a Hazuki Dojo esque area which is nice especially um photograph 17 reminded me very much of the Asiki residence or the dojo there yeah definitely does look at that yeah and 18 very much 18 aesthetic. is interesting because one of the uh, circle things on the roof switch pointed out that actually, actually the kanji for dragon <laughs> which i thought was quite ah. interesting uh, 19 is a little bit of a video map just gives you a sort of a sense of sort of the sakura oka esque area around here yeah that, that's that's very much the walk into town isn't it yeah and i think there's even a bicycle somewhere maybe <laughs> possibly um and then the next one was just just somewhat funny that we we kind of just stumbled across i don't think he's many people stumble across these which actually said it was the first time he'd seen it but it, i think it was a tanuki oh wow yeah which chilling very, very well. He looks a bit ill, to be honest, but yeah, <laughs> um, I thought that was quite cool. And then twenty-one is quite a nice shot. Kind of reminds me of a springtime version of George Kitchen's view from that Sakura. Yes, view you there from Dreams of Saturn. The anime um, shot, actually. Anime it, shot, yeah, like as well. definitely. Um. 22 is just the staircase leading to this next area where there's like a nice shrine area. This again very much Hazuki Dojo area. The nice big cherry tree. Um, so obviously if you flick through a few of those shots, you kind of get the thing there. And then there's one of me sort of practicing my counter elbow assault and pit blow. <laughs> and also one of Switch just did a Hazuki stance, which is fun. Like throughout Japan, probably most people know this, but the 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 manhole covers are very much themed. And this thing's a that. themed one of your Costco in the Costco area. And then just sort of just looking for Shemu S things. There's a, a Phoenix on a building there. 
Um, the next one, number 31, that's quite interesting because we were just joking about coming out of that interview and like Akira Yuki being like the virtual fighter sort of RPG character. And then we saw Yuki's bar <laughs> was like nah. just on Dubuita Street. Then the next shot, sort of your, your Dubuita looking style. Yeah, you can definitely see that there. Yeah. Dubuita Street, the sign, of course. And then 34 is more of a Dubuita Street looking thing. Jacket shop there. Jacket shop, yeah. And then 36 is a little video again, just to sort of get that atmosphere. Oh, there's the vending machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually did a little skit here for Casey's show. I don't know if you saw that, Matt, on, on Casey's 10th I anniversary actually. thing. There's another little skit, actually, I, I'd like you to play, actually. <laughs> just in there. The dreads of this interview um, show. Perhaps not many people will see it, so it'll be all right to play. Um, and then we've got a uh, Dubuita sign there, which a lot of people show a photo of that. Bit of information there. Yeah, I've seen that. And then 38 is interesting. That is the, if you remember the IGN video, Yu Suzuki walking around the anime sort of area. He goes into yes. this place and there's like loads of little shrines and then Menezra pointing at this sign on the wall that, that reads something about the war or. Edo period or something like that. So we took some photos there. 40, Switch pointed out, is possibly the inspiration for the new game you building in the anime. You know, they've got the bigger oh, yeah. sort of elongated yellow building. Uh, 41 is the bus stop, the same one as in the Shemu game. And actually 42, you can play a little bit of that if you like. That is a Shemu fan seeing a buzz approaching. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, it's got to be done. It's got to be done. And um, I probably should have added a bit of music to that, a bit of sound effects to actually get in on the buzz. It's quite funny when it pulls up and getting on the buzz here. And then this buzz actually was the buzz that we needed to catch anyway to get to switch actually took me to uh, a further away area, which he says is the has to be the inspiration for the harbour in the game. Because obviously you're traveling through what appears to be like Wish Road there with that tunnel. And then we actually get to this harbor, which is the Japanese version. So the harbor that's actually close to Dubuita Street is sort of the US military base, which is why there's a lot of like sailor yeah. people walking around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas this is like the Yokosuka Harbor um, area with the, the warehouses. And you can actually see as you're flicking through these photos, some of the resemblance resemblances to, yeah, to the games, yeah. I thought. Um, fishermen. Um, 48 is actually a good one to sort of show off the, the fishermen and whatnot. That sort of atmosphere. Even That's vending machines in like random places like this. Yeah. A lot of see. US military presence there, isn't there? As there I is still, yeah. How... Yeah, with the boats and the big ships. and uh, We're just walking past, I think. I'm not sure because you're a little bit stuttery on my end, but these are. The location where that big gantry train crane used to be. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, in yeah. the game, because that got demolished at one point. That's sort of around this area. Um, and then your next image is just that sort of harbour shot with the ships. And then the one after that, image fifty map. You see the resemblance there to <laughs> Shamu. The security office. Security yeah. office. I like that. Very much so. The shelf is it? He... Yeah, you even got the shelf, which is it. It has to be based on that, right? Yeah, it's got to be. Mm -hmm. 52 is a nice shot with the vendor machine. It just reminded yeah. me of the homeless man getting kicked out of the... Yes. Yeah, yeah. Which might be a nice time to play that clip. Might play that as um, a little skit on the screen there me and Switch had a bit of fun with. I keep telling you, stay out of here. How'd that bum get in here anyway? Young man, sure is a cold day, eh? Don't suppose you buy an old man a can of coffee, eh? I guess I'll take this over to him. Yeah. 
here. Oh. It's so warm. <laughs> Go through the last few images now. So you've got a submarine there, which again you can point out as a bit of a, a beta thing that was in the original beta for Shamu, remember? This shot's cool. That's a cool shot, yeah. And then shoot, looking through the gate as well. Um, yeah. Reminded me very much of like that area that you can't access. But yeah, that 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 warehouse shot's cool. And then we actually found a, a shrine area quite nearby, oh, wow. which again could have been almost another inspiration for maybe the Sakura Oka Shrine, because it had like a sort of a, a small Tory gate thing in front of a shrine with little foxes mm. as well. It very much looked like as you go through these images, you've got some memes there, image 60. But well, image 62 is like I was actually bowing at the shrine. It just reminded me of the um, the remake footage we got. Digital yes, Foundry. There's, yes, there's, yeah, there's like a yeah, placeholder yeah, yeah. guy just bowing at a shrine. Um, so I saw that. 63 and a little Phoenix tobacco shop we saw just nearby as well. It could have been the inspiration for... Um, um, what's her name? <laughs> I know you mean, yeah. Harita-san, Harita-san. Yeah. Yeah. And then the last images we actually visited, this was a, a, another day, but we visited in Yokosuka, uh, not Yokosuka, Yokohama. Interesting, I just thought people might be interested in this. This big complex, if you remember all the way back to the Shenmue premiere, mm, yeah. this is the actual conference hall that the premiere for Shenmue oh, wow. took place. So I took some photos around here um, and actually, there's some photographs in here from the actual premiere video to sort of show the comparisons here. Yeah, you can, yeah, yeah, so you've you got the taxis arriving. You've got this is this would be where Yu Suzuki got out of his taxi from that rank there. Um, a couple of little shots there of Yu Suzuki in that sort of area. And then the next one, I've sort of almost perfectly got the same angle as where the crowd that were lining up to get into here to see. This would be where the, yeah, the crowd would yeah. be seeing the first glimpses of of Shenmue. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Really cool. And then inside the conference, which is crazy, these like this sort of blue and yellow colourful wall thing. And Switch actually pointed out that in in the premiere video, it's the same. same it's exactly the same as it oh, used to be. Yeah. So 74 and 75, you can still sort of see the same thing. So see it, yeah. evidently not much has changed in in the last 20, 30 years or whatever. 76 and 77 are just more, well, the last three images there, Matt, are just sort of jokes. There's one that says Harbour Lounge on that board. Lapis. Harbour Lounge. <laughs> and then Lapis, that must be where Lapis have relocated to after oh, all these years. Go. Yeah. She need, she need to move out. So yeah, that was, Honestly, like I said, just a great day for a Shemu fan there. I just hopefully I've um, gave you a bit of a, a glimpse into what the day was like there overall. So the interview in the morning and then the little event you would switch in the afternoon. So incredible. If anyone out there hasn't been to Japan or Dubuita Street, South Map, get yourself over there. One there's day, so much one cool, day. cool stuff to see. Just through the eyes of a Shemu fan, there's like beauty to be found in the most random places yeah. like that one day i tend to get out there <laughs> absolutely get out there yeah brilliant and there we go guys there we go guys hopefully you've enjoyed that hopefully you've enjoyed what is a monster of a show but that is exactly how we roll in in Shenmue dojo go hard or go home and definitely gone hard with this one with a lot of information great interview by james and switch there um link Thanks, and man. everything will be in the description obviously for everybody to have a look at um, there'll be some there's some yeah. definite discussion points in there be very much interested to see what people think so leave comments below join us on the forums to discuss this interview as well join us on the streams uh join us on all the videos that james and i are putting out and as james said earlier in the video it's very much appreciated that everybody drops in on these videos podcast shows and everything else and it all keeps the name of shenmu alive and every little bit helps guys don't forget to give us a like share subscribe on facebook youtube twitter all the usual places um, don't forget if you want to be a member just for £2 a month you get all the videos ahead of time outside the podcast and you get your name credited at the end of all the videos as well but at 2 hours 36 minutes it's a goodbye from me 
it's a goodbye from me and we'll be back with another show video in the not too distant future guys but take care have a good one Ah, oh, look at the time.